Christmas is To developing news tonight. Shocking claims of a wild sex party at a local Taco Bell. Mm, Mike Rogers, a worker, is making that claim and a lot more in a lawsuit. Yeah, you know, you guys, I've read through a lot of lawsuits at the desk, and I have to tell you, I don't think I have seen one quite like this. This involves a Taco Bell in San Pedro. We sent Sky Cal tonight to get some video of it while I tell you the story. Uh, so apparently, according to this lawsuit, this started at a, a, ho a holiday party in 2022. An employee there says she walked in for the holiday party. It was potluck style. She had her bowl of guacamole there to be able to serve. And when she got in there, the windows were covered with wrapping paper. And she alleges that the cameras were also covered as well. That's all according to the lawsuit. Well, she says she went outside of the parking lot to mingle. And when she came back, she found most of the employees were completely intoxicated. Again, that's according to the suit. And she even says one employee was having sex with his wife in the restaurant while his wife was engaged in intimate acts with two other people. She says that this all went on for a long time. She says in the lawsuit that she told the supervisor about what was going on, and the supervisor threatened to fight her inside of the Taco Bell. She then says she left, came back to get her bowl of guacamole, only to find other employees vomiting in it. She alleges that when she filed an HR complaint, the two employees and the supervisor were ultimately fired. But then she was receiving threatening messages, letters, and uh, her windshield was broken more than a week after the party. Again, all of this, according to the lawsuit, she says that management offered to transfer her to another store. She says that's not enough. That's why she's filing the lawsuit now. Now, this uh, specific Taco Bell is owned by a franchise owner who did not return a couple of publications requests for comments. Corporate for Taco Bell, though, says that the uh, owner expressed frustration in all of this and, ups and is looking into the matter. Taco Bell, by the way, corporate does not own this Taco Bell, doesn't ha really have any say in this. But of course, it is a Taco Bell. A really weird story, though, you guys. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Mike. The video game industry is making big money. One of the most popular is Fortnite, the online battle royale game. But that wasn't enough to keep its maker, Epic Games, from laying off 16% of its workforce back in September. Throughout 2023, more than 6,500 jobs have been lost in the video game industry. That's according to the L.A. Times. To find out why this is happening and what video game job seekers can do about it, we reached out to Amir Satvat. He's a business development director at Tencent Games, and he created the Games Jobs Workbook, a resource on LinkedIn to help people find jobs in the game industry. Last year, I started noticing that a number of my colleagues were losing their positions I said, you know, I have to do something about this, and I wanted to make a set of simple tools for people to immediately jump on to help them look for positions that could get them back in roles faster. How many people would you say that you've helped with this? You know, we've placed over 800 people in jobs, and while there have been, depending upon whom you ask, 6,500 to 7,000 jobs lost in the industry, because, of course, we can't place all of those jobs back in one year, my best estimates, which I've shared with others, is that I believe we placed back nearly a third of the people who've lost their jobs worldwide just through our community. Why have there been so many layoffs this year? You know, games like any industry has a lot of volatility. If we think about COVID, for example, people were at home. There was a lot more demand for movies, for, you know, TV shows, for games. I think a lot of people in leadership perhaps overinvested for that peak and thought that that was going to sustain forever. And of course, it did not. There are other reasons, but I think that's the biggest one. What does it mean then for the industry if there are so many layoffs, considering that from what I've read and heard that 2023 was a great year for video games? It is a great year. I mean, what I would say is 90% of the layoffs were in North America, so those of us here feel it more. I also think the boom-bust cycles of games have become more extreme because of the higher cost of developing games and the types of games that are made. So I think you feel those up-and-down swings, but we've had swings like this, unfortunately, before. I would still say, though, that the games industry is bigger than North American sports and movies combined, so I wouldn't bet against the industry, although this is an awful low. And it's not just one person or two people that make these games, right? It's like a movie. When you see the movie credits roll, there are hundreds of people working on a movie. Does a video game work the same way? 
Oh, it does. It can even be more extreme. You know, big titles by studios like Rockstar that makes Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, they can easily have over, you know, a thousand, even over 1,500 people. So, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that these big titles make multiples the amount of big movies and have multiple the amounts of staff. Amir, do you have any advice for game developers that have lost their jobs recently? Absolutely. I mean, most of all, I would say talk to people and make connections. People understandably are so fast to reach out to others and say, can you help me get a role? That can often feel transactional, especially when they're already getting so many notes. Data I have suggests you're 10 times more likely to get a job if you have any connection to someone on the recruiting or hiring team. Reaching out and just saying, can I talk to you? You have to allow yourself five to six months, even in normal times, I think, to get a job in this industry because it's so competitive. So don't be transactional. Build relationships and take your time. That's Amir Satvat. He publishes resources for video game job hunters. Get a job? What the fuck are you talking to the kid? Baby? Shit. I worked five years in a row when I was in the joint. Pressing them motherfucking license plates. I'm a license plate pressing motherfucker too, baby. Shit. Where well, nigga gonna get a job out here prison license place? People who've been in prison often struggle with employment. Elizabeth Caldwell from member station KWGS reports on some initiatives in Oklahoma meant to keep people afloat after incarceration. At the beginning of every shift, Brianna Jones and her team of so-called industrial athletes limber up their bodies, including their hands. Right thumb. Fingers extend over and out, left thumb, fingers extend. They need over their and out. hands to knead dough. Jones works at Bama Companies at a plant that produces thousands of pounds of dough every day for McDonald's. After stretching, Jones tours the plant floor where flour and other ingredients are piped into huge mixing bowls 24 hours a day. And we have sheeting lines where the dough goes onto the line and gets kind of beat out and then cut into discs. Jones worked her way up at Bama. Five years ago, she started as a pie packer. Then she became an inspector, making sure fruit fillings were good. She applied to be a supervisor several times before she finally got the job. Jones says she loves what she does, but not so long ago, her life was totally different. Some things happened, as she puts it. I ended up in jail and in drug court, and I spent I think about six months in county jail and then six months in a rehab facility. When all that was over, Joan says she was in a tough spot. She was pretty young and had no idea how to even interview for a job. She got help through the Center for Employment Opportunities. It's a national nonprofit that recently celebrated the opening of a new facility in Tulsa. That's where I met Paula Marshall. She's the CEO of Bama Companies. She partners with the center to find workers. Out of about 900 employees, 40 at Bama have criminal records. Marshall says it's one thing to hire formerly incarcerated people and another to support them so that they can stay employed. Custody issues are often ongoing. It doesn't just happen that their kids get brought back to them. They have to go through many months and sometimes years of custody, you know, issues. And um, so that costs a lot of money, too. Housing can be a problem. I mean, I've literally found team members sleeping in their cars in the parking lots. Marshall says she helps them, but not with company resources. It's a fairness issue, she says. Instead, the company puts on fundraisers with proceeds available to employees. I mean, you, you can easily raise 25000 or $20,000 from bringing your suppliers in, doing a golf tournament, putting the excess money that you make in the, in the bank, and letting people get grants when they need it. Oklahoma has one of the highest incarceration rates in the nation and doesn't have a lot of state-run reentry services. Employers like Bama are also rare. Tiffany Shaw spent five years in prison. Now she has a good job, but when she was first released, she struggled with negative thoughts. Like I'm able to check them and make sure that, you know, that I'm knowing that I'm, I'm a good person. Shaw says not everyone getting out of prison wants to or is ready to work, but those who are will move mountains. I will show up every day. 
I will show up when it's snowing. I will show up when it's raining. If my car breaks down, I know which bus to get on. You know why? Because I cannot, I do not want to lose my job. I, I, I just, because I know how hard it is for me to get one, that this is a blessing that I have. Shaw says people who really want to make their lives better should be given a chance. For NPR News, I'm Elizabeth Caldwell in Tulsa. This the city of Chicago. Chicago. Black women, on average, hold more student debt than any other group and often have a harder time paying it off. We have the story now of a borrower who is doing everything she can to avoid becoming part of that statistic. WBEZ's Lisa Corian Phillip joined her for lunch outside her office in the Chicago suburbs. 30-year-old Brianna Kidd is chowing down on some delicious-looking homemade pasta. It's like a spinach linguine, and then I took a bunch of multicolored peppers. I ask if she's always known how to cook. No, but that's why you have the Internet. <laughs> now she cooks most days, an effort to save money. Brianna graduated college in 2015 with a bachelor's degree in psychology and $42,000 in student debt. She started working and making loan payments right away. But after three years, she realized most of it goes to interest and then barely goes to principal. She'd barely made a dent in her overall debt. Panic ensued. <laughs> I'm saying it like I'm reading a novel. <laughs> a year after finishing college, black women owe nearly $39,000 on average in student debt. That's more than any other demographic, according to the Education Trust, a nonprofit that advocates for education equity. And because of gender and racial pay gaps, college-educated black women like Brianna often earn much less than their peers. The racial wealth gap they face is even bigger. All of this means they have a harder time paying back their loans. When it comes to this aspect of my life with these student loans, I refuse to be the statistic. I want to be the outlier, and I will be that. Five years ago, in a little notebook, Brianna wrote down how much she needed to earn to pay off her loans as quickly as possible. I started working two jobs to try to make these ends meet and also to be able to save. She moved in with her dad. I don't have my own house. I don't have my own apartment, but I don't have to pay for rent and utilities all by myself. She cut back on eating out, even at Pot Bellies, her absolute favorite spot. Then, when the pandemic started, Brianna saw an opportunity. Interest was paused, most people stopped making payments, but Brianna doubled down. Pay a lump sum of like two grand on another one, just knock another one out, knock another one out. All that money went directly toward her loan principles. She brought her balance from 37,000 at the start of the pandemic to 10,000 as of early October when the payment pause ended. Brianna recognizes not many are in the position to do what she did, no matter how badly they may want to. My story isn't a one-size-fits-all for everyone. She still works two jobs as a claims adjuster and an insurance agent. So when she's finished working her 9 to 5, she'll go home and work some more. And she still lives with her dad. But she's so close to being debt-free. With some help from local WBEZ listeners, she's now on track to pay off all her student loans in 12 months or less. I can't wait. I'm so excited to be done with this because then I get to start my life. I get to have my life back. Brianna dreams of buying a house with enough kitchen counter space to cook meals with her favorite spices, smoked paprika and cumin. And she wants two bathrooms. I'm tired of waiting for someone who's already in the one bathroom and I'm talking about full. Well, I guess I could have a half. No, give me two full bathrooms. And she wants a two car garage and a grass yard. Brianna thinks she can start saving up for a down payment after her debt is gone. For NPR News, I'm Lisa Corian Phillip in Chicago. Let me catch. You ready? Let me let me bone. Solomon Van Sister. Yo. Yo, what's up, son? What's up, kid? What's going on, kid? Yo, man, I'm just doing my thing, man. think you're ready for a raise? We asked you all to share your experiences asking for your first raise, and Juan sent us this message. The first time I asked for a raise, I was very scared, so it was really hard for me. 
I've been working for around four years in this company and I start to understand how important I was for the team. You have to understand how valuable you are. That's like the biggest lesson I learned from, from that process. Juan is right that knowing your value is important, but getting your first raise is also about being strategic, paying attention to what's going on at your company and with your boss and even your boss's boss. Welcome to New Here, honest conversations and practical advice to help you play the game called work. I'm Eleni Mata. If you're thinking it's time to ask for your first raise and you aren't sure where to start, this episode is for you. One of the biggest things to realize is that getting a raise is a lot more than just having a conversation with your boss where you ask for more money. It's a process that actually starts on day one of your new job. Today, we'll walk you through how to make the case for your first raise, from laying the groundwork to talking with your boss and the negotiation that follows. Here to help us do that are two guests who both have a ton of experience with career and money matters. Anne-Lise Gada, or Anne-Lise Wealth, as she's known on her podcast, is a certified public accountant who writes and educates about personal finance. She's also worked in corporate environments like big five accounting firms, where she's learned how to make the case for her own compensation. And Gork Ng is here too. He's a college career advisor and the author of a book that we think a lot about on this show. It's called The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. Full disclosure, HBR published that book. But Gork started his career in investment banking and later worked in consulting. So he has a lot of personal experience to share. Okay, let's get into it. Before like, I share my story about asking for a raise, I want to ask both of you, do y'all remember the first time that you had to ask for a raise in your first professional job in your career? Well, actually, the first time was when I didn't get paid at all. It was a volunteer opportunity. It was for a for-profit company, so they're making money and I'm helping them make money. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was actually doing a lot more than even some of their current employees were doing. So I said, hey, I'd love to contribute maybe longer term and over the course of school and over the coming semester. I am evaluating a couple of other opportunities. Admittedly, they are paid. I'm wondering if we might be able to talk about a stipend, an honorarium, synonyms for a paycheck. (laughs) (laughs) Not straight up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's really funny. I <laughs> and I think the first time it may have been a gift card now that I think about it. Really? <laughs> yeah. If I hadn't asked, it would have still been zero. Yeah. Wow. So, and Lisa, I'm, I'm curious about your first raise story and then yeah. I'll share mine. Oh, sure. The first few years of my career were a little, I guess, different than most because the company where I worked, they don't give you like a, an amazing salary to start, but what they did do every year is they give you a really good raise. So I didn't really have to fight for the first, I want to say first three, four years to get like 15, 20% raise. So it took me to get out of that job and start another job and then have the surprise three, four percent raise because I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't used to that. So I, I wouldn't call it my first raise, but that's, that was the first time that I actually had to negotiate to get a raise. And, um, you know, it took a few months. I, I want to say a good three, four months. And I did get a nicer bump than four percent. Yeah. Going into like my first professional job, that's when I had to negotiate and ask for a raise for the first time. And I remember like I had to call my mom and was like, so how do you do, like, how do you word it? Because to me, communication is like the hardest thing. It's like, how do I convey this in a way that still sounds professional, but I still sound like me. I still sound authentic. And I like wrote everything down. I practiced, but like also improvised. So practicing the improvise, the improvisation. So I don't feel like I mess up during the conversation Um, Like I asked my manager first, like, can we have the conversation? And she said, yes. And then we scheduled a separate meeting to have the actual conversation. And I told her, this is how much I'm getting paid now. And this is how much I would like to have. And she's like, okay, well, let me get back to you. And I think it took three weeks to a little bit more than that. 
And then she finally was like, oh, congrats. We're giving you this amount. But it was like 12000 less than what I'd asked for. My first instinct was I would like to renegotiate that. And she's like, okay, well, I'm going to try. <laughs> and, and then she came back and she told me, like, I'm sorry. This is the amount that they came up with. I don't think it can go anything higher. But before we go into what do you do when that happens, I was mentioning like one of my challenges is communicating and saying it in a way that sounds professional and appealing. I, I want to ask both of you, what are some challenges that you feel like early career professionals or somebody going into like their first professional job face when asking for a first raise? I think there's, there's you know, several challenges. Uh, one that's very common is wondering if you're worthy of that raise, right? Have you been able to deliver the type of work that would commend that raise? And when you don't have anything to compare, like if you don't have like a peer to talk to or like you did talking to your mother and getting advice from professionals, you might feel like you don't even deserve the raise yet. I think another challenge is you don't necessarily want to come across as someone who's only in it for the money, right? So you might be hesitant to have the conversation. But like, I want to challenge this because aren't we all in it for the money though? Like we're here, we're <laughs> <laughs> like, we're working for the money. So why not ask for exactly. that Exactly, that's how I feel. money, you know, but it is hard, like finding that worthiness. And I don't know if it's like imposter syndrome or if you just struggle with advocating for yourself in general. Yeah, for folks in their early career, and honestly, for the rest of our careers and lives, it's this delicate balancing act of being at the right time and saying it with the right tone. Mm -hmm. What I often see are folks either asking too early or too late, asking too firmly or asking too softly. What? Okay. <laughs> so what? if we're talking what? about too early... I mean, I have lost count of the number of folks I've talked to who have this, oh, kids these days kind of conversation, right? Like, oh, these millennials, these Gen Z, they're so entitled. They just showed up to work for two weeks and now they want to be CEO. That's an example, <laughs> right, of being too early, perhaps. Then there's the opposite end of the spectrum who are folks who may have that imposter syndrome, may not have an insider in the industry who can whisper in their ear and tell them how things really work, in which case mm. they might wait and wait forever. And those are the folks who are waiting for too long. And then you've got folks who are asking maybe too firmly, who come off as if they're entitled to this promotion, or I demand this, or why isn't it that I'm getting paid this? And all of that is just a matter of tone of voice. Meanwhile, there are also folks who are a little bit too soft on the other end of the spectrum who end up kind of negotiating against themselves. I mean, I'm just even speaking for myself, right, where I don't end a question with a question mark. And instead, I start negotiating against myself where I'm like, hey, uh, what if we could talk about this? Oh, but we don't actually have to do this if you don't want to. Mm, and like then over explaining, like, <laughs> over explaining. I yeah, I do that so much. Yeah. And so uh, it's really this delicate balance of both time and firmness. Yeah. So for both of you, when do you think is a good time to ask? Is it like after this one big project that you've done? Do you wait for three big projects that you've done? Like, and all jobs are different. What should one person should be thinking about of like, okay, by this point, I should ask for this raise. And the advice that I've gotten is like, once your job starts to stem out of what your original job description is entailing, like that's when you need to ask. Do y'all agree or disagree? I, I do agree with that. But sometimes it's also just a matter of like, how long have you been with the company? Because you can join a company and within a month or two, they already are giving you more responsibilities than what the original job, job description was for. And I think at that time, it might be too too soon. I do believe that, you know, you if you spend maybe six months, then you have a track record of performing and exceeding expectations and you can make a stronger case. Uh, but also I wanna talk about the folks who have been at a company for you know longer than a year and they're waiting until the next performance review. I think by then mm. it's probably too late. I think mm. you wanna have the conversation 
at the beginning of the year when the goals are being set so that you know exactly how you're going to be reviewed and so that you can keep a record of how you're exceeding expectations so that when the time comes later in the year, you can go to your manager and say, well, you know, as I mentioned earlier this year, you know, I'm, I really want to get a raise. Uh, I, and this is all of the things that I did to warrant me basically asking for a raise because the, the challenge with waiting until performance review time is that the budget might just not be there anymore. Oh, dang. So it really is timing. That's hard. I think what I'm hearing from both of you is that there's timing with respect to where you are in the calendar year and the budgetary cycle, but also yeah. timing as it relates to your performance and your potential, where I first ask myself, am I a high performer in the eyes of other people? Then the question becomes, are you also a high potential? And that speaks to the, the conversation you just had about are you extending beyond your core job description where mm -hmm. folks are seeing enough potential in you that they're thinking, hey, you're too good to just be doing this. How about we also pull you into this other thing? How about you come join us at this important client meeting? And once you find yourself extending beyond that core job description, you're in many ways already getting a promotion, quote unquote. You're getting a promotion in the form of additional responsibilities, which is a good endorsement that people trust you, that's the point at which it starts making sense to start asking yourself, hey, okay, I've gotten promoted from the perspective of more important responsibilities. Can now I ask for a better job title and hmm. can I ask for more money? I wasn't thinking about promotion in that way, like where like, oh, you're getting asked to do more or like be part of more meetings. Like I wasn't thinking about it. So I like, I like that because now I'm like, Hey, I've been promoted. I've been promoted a lot. I should, <laughs> I should be, I should be talking more. Like clearly but I'm I, worth more to you now. Um, yeah, now let's you're make reminding things me to these out. things. Yeah. Fair. I like that. I feel like I need to have you in my corner to be like, Eleni, <laughs> this just happened. So you're worth more. I have, I have a question from a listener, Harshini. And they said, I just started a couple of months ago. The salary listed was 1.5 times the one they offered me since I didn't have enough experience. My manager and my team is happy with my work, and I think I'm delivering results faster than they expect as well. Do you think I can directly ask them for a raise in my salary to 1.5, the original listed salary? Or how long should I wait before I talk about a raise and how much can I ask for? What do y'all think? If you're at the six month mark, you can definitely ask for a raise. You're able then to demonstrate the value that you've been able to bring to the company, to the team, and you are more likely to get a raise or at least be in line to get a raise soon. I think that it's very important though to also do some internal research and kind of understand in terms of your company, what is the policy when it comes to raises within the company. So if you're already part of the company, it's unlikely that they'll give you a 50% raise. But uh, once you have the data from the HR department and you know where the company stands in terms of how much you can get percentage-wise increase, then you know what the max is and you can tailor your ass based on that. But I definitely think that if this person has been able to exceed expectations, they've been able to deliver, they can make a case for this. Yeah, I love the advice of doing some research because you really need to have a conversation before the conversation mm. where- Talk about it. Tell me about it. Yeah. Well, this is where a, a raise and the conversation that hopefully leads that raise isn't just something you want to wake up one day and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to set up a meeting. In an ideal world, you're coming at this having already had a couple of other conversations with folks around this person or this decision. Mm. And that means building allies and mentors at this workplace as early as your first day or even before then to understand how do things actually work around here? Because when I think about this particular case, it sounds like there's a policy, there's what's written, but there might be some ambiguity or some ability to bend those rules. And so the first thing I would try to understand is, okay, 
where does this experience clause come from? And do they have something very rigid as in you need to have two years of experience, a master's degree, and some work environments really are that rigid, but anything short of that. And maybe there's something about not experience, but contribution. It sounds like Harshini's situation is one where people were expecting that with experience comes a greater ability to contribute, but Harshini was able to contribute so much more despite the lack of experience. Yeah. If that's the case, well, can we revisit this because the spirit of the policy is one of contribution and not experience? That's something mm. you need to learn from a coworker who's been through this process before. You want to be armed with as much information as possible. Should we go in with a set number when like going into the room to have this conversation? I believe you should have two. You should have what you're going to ask and what your real number is. The reason being, most likely you won't necessarily get what you want because remember, it's going to be a negotiation. So yeah, my philosophy is have two numbers. I love that. Me too. And when it comes to having those two numbers, there's probably going to be some of, somewhat of a difference between the number that's possible within your particular context and the number that you're actually valued at with the market. And so another way of thinking about your, your worth, which is kind of at the crux of this whole conversation, yeah. is what else could you get? Now, the more antagonistic way of doing this, and some people unfortunately really are in the situation, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, is someone comes along like a recruiter, for example, and says, hey, check out this role. We can pay you this much. And it's like, oh my goodness, it's magnitudes more than I currently have. Those people go to their company and say, hey, I would love to really you know, have this conversation about whether I could get a little bit more. And then the company shoots down the conversation. And then they accept this other offer that's paying them a lot more and they come back and then their company's like, oh, wait a second. Like, actually we could pay you more. In which case, you know, folks are then coming back and thinking, well, did it really take someone else to pull me away for you to really treat me with value. So that's the antagonistic way. The other one is to have these other benchmarks in your back pocket and say, hey, you know, I'm evaluating these opportunities and or I was doing this research or my peers at other organizations or I'm deciding between, I, I have decided when I accepted this job offer between this opportunity and this other opportunity, what would it take for us to get closer to or to match what I've been offered or however much the market is valuing me at. Yeah. So how do you plan for that conversation so you can sound confident and you just, you just sound like you're ready when you're going in there? Like, what is your advice of preparing for that conversation? So there's a slight difference between achieving a salary match versus salary parity. So salary match is where you're matching something that's external. Versus, and unfortunately, this is especially the case for folks who are coming from underrepresented backgrounds and women, which is that they're just paid less than their coworkers, and that's achieving salary parity. So, hey, I'm performing at this level. My peers are getting paid this much. What would it take? Mm. And that moves us into that conversation where the general structure of the conversation that I found helpful is to say, here are the facts or here's the situation. This is what my request is, what would it take to make this work? So what you're saying is, hey, look, like here's the world, here's the state of things. I would like to respectfully see what we can do yeah. to achieve this parity or this match. Can we please have a conversation about what this would take? So you're asking, not necessarily for permission, but you're inviting a conversation. And it's yeah. much less antagonistic than like, wow, why are you not treating me well enough? Or I deserve so much more which might rub folks off in the wrong way. And it's ultimately about whether the other person wants to help you just as much as mm. they can help you. I think it then becomes like the long game of how do I cultivate this relationship or this conversation so that I can meet this final goal. It is that sort of let's plant the seed of the conversation. Let's talk about it. Let's cultivate it. You're, you're taking care of it. This is the conversation and you're like taking care of it over time. I love that. Um, yeah, it does take time and you're planting seeds and you're inviting a conversation, which will probably lead 
as was the case in your situation to another conversation to another conversation. Yeah. So what if your boss or your manager, whoever you're asking, seems hostile or disinterested in this conversation? What should you do then? So is it that you maybe caught your manager at the wrong time or do you think that they're just not invested in your development? So let's say that they're not invested in the development. I'll give you a very honest yes, <laughs> answer. Yes, I think, yes. <laughs> I think that's when it's time to start thinking about maybe another position. It could be within the company mm. or outside of the company. But I do think that if your manager is not interested in helping you grow, then beyond this raise, it's going to be a, a challenge for you to grow within the company. Yeah. Red flag. is. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so we, we have this conversation or multiple conversations and, you know, how, how do we wrap it up nicely in a bow? Now, I've seen on TikTok that, like, once you give the amount, you just be quiet. And I am trying to practice that because I'm also an over-explainer. Like, what you were saying, Gork, earlier was like, oh, I'll negotiate against myself and I'll just, like, word vomit. And I'll be like, you know, it's okay. Like, we could do this. So I've been trying in a lot of different ways just being like, this is my ask there. <laughs> That's it. But you can feel really uncomfortable. But I think it, like, kind of shows poise and, like, confidence like this is what i'm asking for um but that's my outlook gork do you agree <laughs> at least do you agree <laughs> like how do you end the conversation so i do agree that you know once you give your number you shouldn't try to negotiate against yourself like you've already explained how you get to the number so after that it's time to just move on and talk about something else so i would you know give my number and then see if there's any reaction from the manager typically they'll, you'll get some type of reaction. And then I will try to wrap the conversation by asking when you can follow up. You know, I don't expect you to give me an answer right now. So when would be an appropriate time to follow up with you and pick this conversation back up? And I would, after the meeting, make sure to document what we discussed, you know, sending an email, keeping a, a nice record of the conversation and repeating the agreement that you had on when you're supposed to follow up. Yeah. And when, so that just email would be like, thank you again for meeting me today where we talked about X, Y, Z and just keep this as a reminder, like we'll be meeting again at this date. Like that's a good structure. Uh, yeah. I'll just add a little fluff around, uh, you know, the fact that <laughs> Always. You, know, you enjoy working, uh, yeah. working with him, the company, and then just wrap it up exactly as you said. And the reason why I'm mentioning following up with something in writing is something actually happened to me, you know, years back, a few years back. So I had a conversation with my manager and already, you know, he went back and talked to whomever he needed to talk to. So at that point, it wasn't like official, right? But the, my manager told me at the time, all right, I already talked to the CFO. We're good. We just need to get through this month, right? Yeah. And then... Two months later, my manager leaves, the CFO leaves. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. So now I have to go to HR and say, hi, you know, we're working on this promotion. So like, can you tell me like what's going to happen? And HR asked me, do you have any proof of this? Cause we're not aware. Okay. Ah, oh, man, I would have cried, but thank you for sharing that. And like, Absolutely. yes, document always all the time. <laughs> well, it's a lesson. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, we're going to lean into this last section, which is the aftermath of what happens after this big conversation. And we have a listener question about this from Florian. And they said, what would you recommend if the supervisor says something like, we do not have the budget for that, or we are not able to meet your expectations? Yeah, I, I was neither an English major nor a lawyer, but I can't help but like drill down on the specific wording that was used there. Like we, like, is it, who's we, like, is it you? Is it HR? Like, is it your manager? Is it your manager? Would you ask manager? that? Would you challenge well, and be like, what do you mean is me? What that's what would be going through my head. I, I wouldn't, I, I, this is not a litigation here, but uh, that would be kind of my first like shower thought, right? Is okay. 
uh, how much of this is we can't versus I don't want to. Mm. And then we can't or we don't have budget. I think I would try to understand that as well. One of the things that I, I think is just helpful to do in any of these situations is shower people with gratitude. Like, thank you so much for taking the time to look into this for me. I really appreciate your support and your advocacy. I'd love to learn more about the conversation and how I can best navigate next steps. Like, keep it super ambiguous. I, I totally made that up, so make this your own. <laughs> and meet with your manager, and this could just be in your next one-on-one. -on -one. I would keep it super open-ended and have them kind of do the word, you know, the, the word vomit of what happened, because you don't know what they're going to say. So I would just say, oh, thanks so much again. I'd love to hear more about the conversation that you had and what went into this decision. And then just <laughs> shut up and let them yeah. speak. <laughs> they might tell you everything, right? They might say, oh my goodness, yeah. I was really trying to advocate for you. And it was actually so-and-so or like, we're just, we're just short on, on, on this budget line item, but like, let's talk in three months or three weeks or hey, let me revisit this conversation with this other person. Like, let them talk because you really yeah. never know where that conversation would go. I have one question that's actually really interesting to me because I wasn't introduced to this idea until last year. I'm part of like a Slack channel for salary or like just money talk. And somebody had asked like, are there other things that I can negotiate for if I don't get the salary that I asked for? And I had seen these options like, oh, you, if you work from home, see if you can negotiate like them reimbursing you for your Wi-Fi because you need Wi-Fi for you to continue working from home or ask if they can reimburse you for your easy pass. Like I didn't know that you could negotiate for more things outside of money if you don't get the amount that you asked for. So is that a thing? And what what can I negotiate for? Yeah, that's definitely a thing, you know, and you can also negotiate for more PTO. Also, if oh. you can't get a salary increase, you can ask for a bonus because it doesn't come necessarily from the same bucket. And also the bonus is a one-time commitment from the company. So it's, it's worth uh, asking. There's a lot of things that you can negotiate outside of the salary itself. And what about you, Gord? What else would you add to that? Yeah. Well, you could ask for, for example, tuition reimbursement, budget to attend a conference or a particular professional development opportunity. I think the PTO piece is something that you can and should ask for. Like I'm thinking of a mentee slash a friend of mine who was up against some really tight deadlines and a really stressful project and hadn't taken time off for a while and through just a casual conversation, ended up getting like double their vacation days after this major product launch. Wow. So yeah, if you're trick-or-treating and there's like no <laughs> chocolate left, ask for candy. Totally. <laughs> well, zing moment. Context of white supremacy. Undignified Negro Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, December 1, 2023. So I have been told this is our weekly summit on neutralizing workplace racism, not for spectators. If you have figured out some tidbits, what to do, how to solve problems, let us know. You do not ever have to, man, you don't have to worry about, it. you go to the Christmas party, Lord, you don't even want to know what I saw him doing in the punch bowl, Lord. Oof. You don't have to worry about that. Everybody keeps their clothes on. No hanky panky. No one is tipsy. They behave themselves and leave in an orderly fashion, orderly and sober fashion. If you have all this nonsense to begin with. You don't have to worry about being laid off. You don't have to worry about, I'm going to lose my job, and i got to fret and worry each day and make sure I'm not late and all that. 
No. You are compensated correct. You don't even have to waste time with all that nonsense about, you know, how to ask for a raise and boss, can we talk and that's that. I am compensated correctly. I'm valued. They recognize my worth, how I contribute to the bottom line, success of the whole organization. If you are in that position, could have saved us a good twenty minutes of what we just heard, please share the number six oh five three one three five one six four the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate the email until justice at gmail dot com number again six oh five three one three five one six four the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate certainly if you you know have suggestions if you have difficulties as always dial in write email let us know we will do our best to use logic help you figure out how to uh, solve some of the problems neutralize racist activity in your workplace even problems with other non-white people victims of racism I want to emphasize I include these segments at the beginning I always think it is important try to study really learn a little bit about everything someone says that specifically with labor to investigate on a regular basis really and at minimum at least your field study and I would say study your field in general and then racism within your field everybody that should be if you're trying to think a topic search at the library bing that can be one search from your residence racism in your specific field it could start within your state this hemisphere the globe whatever but those would be two I always try to include those reports that is not fluff that is not filler that is not wasting time there are so many more things you never want to wait add that to the 10 stops do not waste non-white people's time including your own there's so many things Gus T could be doing <laughs> The University of Washington is playing in the Pac-12 championship game. I'm sure I could be someplace with some guacamole and, you know, watching cheer them on. Woo! They got ice skating. It's Christmas time. I just told you it's December. They got ice skating right downtown Seattle. I could be going, getting my ice skate on. Real talk. I just saw it today. They have happening right this moment you know Pike Place Market where they throw the fish anytime they show Seattle on television nationally really globally I guess they show Pike Place Market downtown next to the water and they're throwing fish right so downtown Pike Place Market today at this moment the great figgy pudding caroling competition come on having prizes and everything I would have gone just for the you know hoot of it all that in addition they have uh, die hard the play that's all month long so that's not you know I got plenty of time to catch that want to know who's going to play uh, John McClain talked about that with Dr. Martin Kevorkian in any way missing all that to be here neutralizing workplace racism now the reports that we heard specifically cannot wait to get to the raise part get to that later the Taco Bell office party talked about that last week I forgot I think I got that in the very end because we were on for so-called Thanksgiving at the very end of the broadcast I said I'll make sure I include that you know not making this up or what have you legitimate we'll see what happens with the lawsuit again if 
you have to attend. I, I always include that. We are in a system of white supremacy racism. I have been on jobs. We have other non-white people who have dialed in and said that they have been on jobs where they feel like they were fired or at minimum they it was not well received white people were not pleased that they did not attend the Christmas jamboree or I mean whatever the birthday shindig whatever it is they were upset if you know I'm gonna have to show my face at this Christmas party for at least 20 minutes 30 minutes you should remember that Taco Bell event she said she went the signs were there when you see things are awry and I would even say from the very jump if it's at a bar Real talk, we are days away from what they call dry January. It's so popular, they've been doing it for so long now, I might not even need to explain it. Dry January. For the people maybe listening to this in the catacombs after we got justice 50 years later or whatever, uh, dry January, after we've done all this imbibing and, you know, eggnog spiked with everything and threw up in the punch bowl and everything else, and if we survive, get to January without having the DUI and ran over the neighbor's dog and all the rest of it. Now, we're not going to drink. Be teetotalers for the month. Just do a lot of water, extra lemon. Take it easy. Why don't we just do that all the time? They, they got the science now saying, hey, more than one drink per week, that C word, carcinogenic headed towards cancer e why not just do that the whole time I say all that there is enough science and with dry January looming I've said before you might be able to say and legit get away with you know substance abuse has been a major problem for members of my family and people that I care about so as a result I just choose to exclude myself from environments where there's going to be substances and that sort of thing I'm you know I'm no prude or I'm not out here on prohibition I just don't you know I've I've dealt with a lot in my life uh, as it relates to uh, alcohol and all that and just uh, yeah I don't uh, I just don't participate in those type of environments I think you could legitimately say that white person non-white person boss whatever and I don't think you would have to go and give a whole lot of evidence. I think they'd be, oh, I bet he's got an on on crack. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all right, Willie. That's all right. You take it easy. And yeah, don't you, they give you any lip. You let them know. I said, it's all right. Thank you for telling me, Willie. Mm-hmm. Old crackhead, Willie. That's what they, you know, that's what they think of us anyway. So that's super easy. You, I, I haven't heard other people, I think I've gave this suggestion before. I haven't heard anyone say that they tried it out and, you know, see how it goes. But I'm, super con- I think I've also said I don't know if this will work for the party but if people are getting on you like what are you doing and all that you can just tell them you know hey I was uh, raised uh, seven day and we just didn't do all those you know holidays and such uh, and like I said if you phrase it that way it suggests that you might not be practicing now so you're not tied to any of the current religious practices and all of that but just the gr- the foundation as a child was laid I don't participate in all of this see and I have heard people say that they've used that one bing worked without causing a problem but all of that to say if you do have to go to the party you are sober I've said for years you take one person with you if you're in a care mate situation you take your attempted partner bang we're gonna go we are gonna be sober and we the night before the weekend before whatever uh, if it's a weekend thing the day of no problem we will sit down. We will talk about what do we think could happen. We'll get our code together. If this happens. We do this. It could be an eye signal, words, hand signal, whatever. Get it all together. How long are we going to stay? We're doing 30 minutes. Okay. Bang. This is what we do. Boom, 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 boom. You keep an eye on my drinks. Make sure they don't swango me. And all right. We're not eating. We're not eating. We're not eating. And we got all that together. And there you go. 30 minutes. Long enough, you can go around, say hi to everybody you need to. People saw you, get in a quick picture, and bing. Leave if you bring food. Leave 
it. I say, that's ignorant man. I'm not fixing to take my mama's china to the Taco Bell party. Especially if she's not with us anymore. Come on. Nah, nah. They're clumsy and goofy and might be drinking and all the rest of that. Nah, nah. You can go. They got uh, real cheap temporary containers. You can go to Target and all the rest of it. And I mean like less than $5. Man, they get, you can get a whole trough, right? Get one of those big like uh, aluminum uh, troughs for just a couple dollars. Bam. There you go. Leave it. I don't even have to go back in. They got, sound like they got Gomorrah from the Bible days going on in their life. Man, I'm good. They say, don't turn back. You'll turn us all. Just keep rolling. Run, run, run. Anyway, uh, the next one, they talked about the video gamers being laid off uh, in large numbers, 6,000 uh, plus uh, of them. Uh, one, I know so many people, you know, have they got generations now addicted to games and screens, phone and all the rest of it. I know tons of non-white people would love that job or any sort of job that's helping with developing video games and would even love that as a career path. Like, oh, let me go be an electrical engineer or something like that where I could go and help them computer engineer and help them develop video games. Wow, that's amazing. And that would love that. But they included within the layoffs and why this is happening and all of that. They said it's difficult. It's really competitive. Who wouldn't want this sort of job? But they said it's so competitive it might take a half a year or more to get into the industry and you have to have an industry insider to get you boop, that job at least get your foot in the door metaphor man I will be willing to bet a substantial amount of money the industry insiders do not look like Benjamin Crump Michelle Obama I could be wrong I'm just saying anyway cronia and that's I told you man like cronyism oh you'd have to explain that to your child from day one and in detail about when they get on all this old meritocracy and I no, no 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 that is not even cronyism I hope that's the opposite. Like if you, you know, when they give you the uh, antonyms, when you look up, so when you look up meritocracy, the antonym should be in all capital letters, cronyism and or white supremacy racism. Next, they had the segment. Now, this was fascinating. I have to give you the spelling. So we heard uh, about Brianna Jones, B-R-E-E-N-N-A Jones formerly incarcerated and so now she has a job needing dough uh, that would be the D-O-U-G-H dough for McDonald's I guess for their biscuits and egg McMuffins and all the rest of it sesame seed buns for the uh, Big Macs and such she's needing dough and talks about she, Brianna Jones said I'm nervous it's so hard for me to get a job now pause just because Brianna Jones in Oklahoma, Tulsa. <laughs> I found it even tacky that they didn't mention this is in Tulsa with all the, the legacy and so-called reparations. Brianna Jones, her relatives, a part of all of that. No reparations, so she has whatever difficulties, ends up being incarcerated, and now she's got to hope that she's able to need dough for McDonald's. We are in the book club reading about old Mike Swango, convicted felon. And he just keeps getting hired and keeps getting hired and keeps getting hired at all these medical facilities as a convicted felon. Brianna Jones chilling. Or excuse me, Brianna Jones nervous. Man, my car breaks down. I know the bus route immediately. I am not losing this job. McDonald's. Man. Now I will say, hey, that straight code Mr. Fuller said the same thing everybody should think about that when you take your job you already know my car is working and or I got this job it was June now it's December it has been snowing already in some places 
is that going to impact what normally is a 15 minute ride to work if it snows does that now become an hour ride to work does that now become I can't even drive it he said all of that think about that that might even be one that you have to talk to people in advance so that they can tell you like oh my lord this road ice is over and they never scrape the street here like oof if you don't have four wheel drive you will be stuck or crashed or whatever it is or blah 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 they, and or you might find out oh this company we value keeping our company employees safe we provide transportation and I've heard that uh, from some folks where they either have transportation that is equipped driver who knows how to drive in the snow and they just drop people off or you have a car that is not four wheel drive and all the rest of it they just get you a car they rent you a car so that you can drive in the snow so that you're a lot safer easier to get there and all that if you either don't have a car and or have a car but it's not the best for inclement weather but even that would be something you might have to talk to other workers and or it would be best to find all that out in advance then we heard from B R I A N N A kid Brianna kid I had to do a double take like is that really what happened yep that's what happened Brianna kid she's paying off her forty two thousand dollars in debt amazing many people do not get that opportunity even if they wanted to be that committed many non-white people victims of racism because you don't get employed keep us squatters on the move make you lose the job that sort of thing other expenses so for a lot of non-white people they would like to be thrifty but white people can be or white people are the greatest distractors in the known universe but kudos to her for uh, fiscal responsibility uh, in paying off her uh, debt so early uh, not being bogged down with all of that interest interestingly in that segment they did bring up the so-called gender and then racial pay caps they didn't say racism white supremacy they put gender first I have said consistently they include white women there really is not you know a gargantuan gap in what white women make and what white men make. white men do make a little bit more but in order for them to show a gender gap they have to pull in the racism and get all the non-white females where oh yeah they don't yeah we don't pay nigra males or nigra females and then they put the racism second that is so common where it will be mentioned in just that way gender and racial pay gaps I'm sure Brianna Kidd black female I'm sure gender is the leading problem in her life in Tulsa Oklahoma uh, and then, oh, and then uh, Brianna Kidd in Chicago who paid off her loan, she said she's doing all this and staying with her father, even that sort of thing, because a lot of folks, what did I just say? Brianna Jones in Tulsa, Oklahoma, maybe she can't go stay with a relative or parent and not have to pay rent so she can focus all of her resources on paying off these loans. Hey, if they've had a racist purge and killed and booted out all the black people, then you got to start over. And that happened what, more than 250 times. So lots of black people, that's not even an option. Deliberately so. Design, really, it's not even supposed to be an option for Brianna Kidd. Racists work hard to see that that sort of thing doesn't happen on a widespread basis. And if it was, I'm sure they would change things up. Anyway, uh, Miss Kidd, all-star again for her financial... Uh, dedication and making a plan really a financial code really to solve this problem she said that she wants it all she wants the two-car garage and the big house and all of that I said man even the things that we are conditioned to want in the system of white supremacy that's their plan uh, all of that by races done races have kind of set it up to make it difficult for black people to even get that and even that like the two-car garage like oh is it, are they gonna be EV big, just get more big SUVs to guzzle up all that gas and run people down on the street justice not a two-car garage and house justice justice uh, let's see okay and then the last segment on the rays man I was so fascinated by that clip 
Um, I think I've talked about neutralizing workplace racism for years, the importance of asking for a raise. I think uh, Don Clemson dad has dialed in before and told us about the process when he went uh, to get a raise and then getting a certification in. Grand, I think the black African dialed in as well. And remember that one? They had talked about the raise and all of that, and then they do the, you know, on second thought, uh, we're not going to be able to do it. You know, it's been tough. We got to, it's, it's just been tough. We just don't have it. You're not upset, are you? You upset? Uh oh. It looks like you're, you, you, oh Lord, you're getting upset. You look like you're upset. Yes, Lord, you look like you're upset. You're about to smack me upside the head. You sure you're not upset? You look a little upset. You sure you're not upset? You look like you're mad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and see, they did all that. And then they finally come around. You, you sure you're not mad? You sure? Okay. Well, if, if you're not mad, I think we did actually find a few extra nickels. So we're going to go ahead and give it to you. Um, but you sure you, okay. We don't want you to hold a grudge. Be angry about it. Like, what the? Like, do all that messing you around about it. We're going to give it to you. Oh, we're not going to give it. We give it. We, anyway, I always love when non-white people get a raise, ask for a raise. I think we even got that suggestion. Bay Area Scholar working so hard down at the uh, no-count Starbucks uh, in California doing extra work. John Henryism. Hey, ask for a raise. You're going above and beyond the call of duty. Video games, ask for a raise. And if they don't give it, give them the 70%. Ease back. That segment, in fact, I was even more intrigued hearing it again because the first time through, this is Harvard Business Review, who I normally grouse about because typically if they talk about racism, in my view, they give out horrendous suggestions. They're not accurate uh, and they're not even, you know, talking in an honest manner about the problem. This segment was not about racism. This was about asking for a raise, and even quite a bit of it having to do with words, tone. I was even more intrigued when I heard this again because I typically think of Harvard Business Review as mostly white people. They do have non-white participants. We've played some before, but generally white-dominated Harvard, white-dominated space. That segment about requesting a raise was exclusively non-white people. The host, Eleni Mata, M-A-T-A, uh, and then the two guests, Anne Liz Nata, N-G-A-T-T-A, and Gorik Ng, uh, N-G, Ng, non-white, non-black male, and then I think two black females. Now, I also think, importantly, for all the segments that we heard today, uh, so-called uh, incarceration, greater confinement, and difficulties getting employment, not for Swango, paying off your student loans, uh, the Taco Bell orgy, everything asking for a raise, no black males in any of those reports. Black male privilege. Anyway, uh, but this segment, it was exclusively non-white people, and even for this subject matter, there was a lot of snickering in that report. A lot of useful information, I thought, too, but there was a lot of snickering. And I wondered if it had been all white people. And they're talking about the same subject matter, asking for a raise, same, same uh, dynamics, what I think, gender dynamics, two people that I think, two females and then one male, same dynamics, but all white. Would there have been as much snickering, giggling? I'm not sure. Maybe I do. I'm very aware white people do podcasts, videos, all the rest where they chuckle, even if they're talking about serious subject matter for sure. But I just came to mind anyway, uh, with these non-white, two non-white females, one non-white male speaking about all of this. And they started with Gorik Ng, non-white, non-black male. And he talks about having an intern and he's looking at job opportunities where he's going to be paid and going to them where he is a non-paid intern and saying, hey, it's possible I could be compensated. And he said that he thinks that they gave him a gift card. Now that even, hearing it again, that this is a non-white male, like, dang, that is kind of, that's kind of a niggerish experience. Like, 
if I'm qualified, if you're out interviewing and what have you, and you're well enough where other people are looking at hiring you, if you've been interning, if you've done well there, are they not interested in hiring you at all? Do they not have money? Is this not going to be an option at all? Like, are they interested in developing? They give you a gift card? For how, like, <laughs> for $5? They could give me a, like, for what? $10? 50 like, come on. That is, man, <laughs> let me look at my, update my resume, man. Like, come on. That also just sounded very different to me. Like, oh, yeah, this is a non-white male. But okay. And he was indirect about it and saying, you know, is there a way we can look at compensation and all the rest of it? I, that was where it gave me pause. Like, if this had been a white person, would they have been more direct? I'm doing this intern. I'm looking at career development, uh, other opportunities where I could be hired. Uh, is there a career path for me here? And just have them tell you. Uh, let's see. The, the portion where they talked about uh, promotion, the term promotion, what does that mean? Uh, all of that I thought was so important. And even it gave me pause because I think it was the host, non-white female, Elena Eleni Mata, where she said she spoke with her mother about, okay, what word should I use? How should I sound? My tone, all of that when I go in to ask for a raise. Have you spoken, listeners, have you spoken with your offspring about asking for a raise on the job? I was thinking about that myself. I don't remember my parents talking to me about how to ask for a raise, when, what words to use, like information you want to have with you, make sure you document if this is a verbal. I don't remember any suggestions in that manner. And that's what I mean. You don't need a book per se. That's when you don't need a manual. You can talk to your child about your own experience. Now, if you've never asked for a raise, you should tell them that too and tell them why. If you don't want them to repeat that pattern, then just make sure tell them, hey, I don't have the best information because I never asked. I was intimidated, but I don't want you to be. Their podcast, their YouTube, maybe we can watch some together and learn. We just heard a little bit. But you can tell them that too. But make sure, talk to your child. I said about your own work experience. And Did you ask for a raise? Did you get it? Yes. No. What did they say? Tell them about all of that. That way they'll be more informed when they start their career. Uh, let's see. They talked about you don't want to seem like you are just about the money when you go to ask for a raise. Now, before the host responded to this, I said, that is some nonsense, really, keeping a G rated. Uh, it is always about, number one, it is about white supremacy, racism, one. And then next down is get this money. And as much as you are supposed to, as much as possible, that's everyone in the work environment. I don't know what else there is to do other than practice racism. Now, you can do all the sexual intercourse and stuff like that, but I mean, that is, you know, I do not think that should be a priority above making money and as much of it as you possibly can. That's why I say all the phoniness and lying and pretense because they try to do all that. We're a family and I no. We are employees who are here to make money. This is a company, a business that is about making money. Even the nonprofits, literally the New York Times yesterday published about how the nonprofit hospitals, they are about making money, even at the expense of the patient, sounding just like Swango, making money. So get out of here. They try and get you with all that. Why are you really here? And What's your purpose? To make money. Duh. Come on, why are you here? Why was this company even made? Uh, the They talked about the so-called imposter syndrome, meaning I'm not really qualified. I don't really deserve this position. I certainly don't deserve a raise. I've heard this sometimes associated with uh, black people, non-white people, and saying, well, you don't really deserve this spot in school or this job because you are an affirmative action higher, and so you didn't really earn uh, this spot or what have you, your token or charity placement, that sort of thing. I, and, and even some non-white people, victims of racism, believing this. I never 
hear about white people with all, with all of the cronyism, all of the industry insider hookups that they have and their grandpa and their grandma and all the rest of it. I don't ever hear any of them. Uh, Alec Murdoch down there now, old convicted felon in South Carolina. I didn't hear him before all this saying, you know, I just feel like an old imposter down here in the low country of South Carolina. I'm just living off of my white papa and grandpapa's legacy and what they did. You know, I'm not even a good lawyer. I, I don't hear white people say that. They get all kinds of hookups and get jobs that they're not qualified for and all the rest of it. And they get their cup of coffee and are chilling. Males and females, chilling. Uh, even again, hear, hearing that differently here because it was exclusively non-white people talking about a raise and imposter syndrome comes up. That system of white supremacy racism, please. Uh, the imposters are the racists. Uh, let's see. They talked about some of the points where you know in turn for yourself when it's time to ask for a raise. Once they start moving you to assignments that are beyond your job description, this is so popular for non-white people. White people know that they boss us all over the plantation on the job and off and so they get us to do other people's work their work and just all this everything really anything that they can think of you know um, that is so common be aware of that even keep a copy of what your job description is what your duties are so that hey once they start creeping beyond that we need to revisit and they said revisiting both what your compensation is and what your title is all of that would require, hey, because I'm more valuable to the company, I'm doing more. Brilliant. Uh, they, they talked about <clears throat> having data to evidence, you know, what you've done for the company over the time period. Uh, and then again, they came back to terms where they talked about knowing whether or not you are seen as a high performer or someone with high potential. Now that's one of those I would want to know what do they mean exactly? Because they'll have a lot of times where you'll have black people who are doing lots more than what their duties and responsibilities are, but they're still a Negro. They're not seen as a high performer or a hard worker, whereas you conversely, you Michael Swango, high performer, high potential, and this dude is a cheating, lying, convicted felon. That's what I mean. Like, I would need more data. That's one of those kind of nebulous they would have when we have our review or whatever it is with the manager, like, okay, I want to be seen as a high performer. What does that mean? Now, if you tell me it's you are here on time, you get your assignments done, you contribute at the meetings, blah, blah, blah. And this, Like, if you itemize it for me, oh, okay, I'll make sure to have those metrics when we come and it's time for my, you know, raise consideration. No problem. I'll have a printout with all that data for everyone. When they talked about uh, oh, what is a promotion in quotes, and they said the addition of responsibility should be thought of as a promotion, I exercise great caution with that because I've seen lots of scenarios where that will be one of the tricks to getting victims of white supremacy, non-white people, to do all of these extra tasks with glee, where they try and make it seem like, oh, yes, you're so valuable. That's why we have you working all these shifts and doing all this extra work and blah, blah, blah. But it's never reflected in the pay. They might say a nice word, you know, about you in front of someone else from time to time. Frequently not. But it never, there's never an extra piece of cornbread. There's never a gift card. You don't get an extra piece of coal in your stocking. Nothing. They don't update your job description. Nothing. That's why I say I'm very, in fact, that is the essence of John Henryism. I gleefully take on all this extra work where I'm working two, three times as hard and I'm not making all that progress. That's how the caller in Florida, that's how you end up with the black female. Been working here for 19 years and no promotion. I'm sure they have added to her duties. You got white people working there who can't even type. But I can't get a promotion.
That's why I say I'm a little bit cautious about that. Thinking, oh, wow, I've been promoted. I'm doing all this. No, no, I'm just a nigger. Being niggerized further. Uh, the They talked about the get information from those around you. Uh, specifically, if there is written policy about raises, or is this a discretion type of a thing? Meaning, is there a specific formula or, you know, raises? This is exactly the way it's written down, the way that we go about evaluating if you are subject to a raise, and this is what you have to do to qualify for that raise and how much it's going to be, or is this just a, you know, we'll see what Bob says. <laughs> you know, we'll see how Bob feels today if he's, you know, Bob likes you and, you know, his wife made those great pumpkin cheesecake bars that he loves at the beginning of the week. You'll probably get it. He's having a tough week. His wife got on his nerves, spent a lot of money. Might not get it. You want to know that. Have as much. That's why I've said before you want to try to cultivate sources. I wouldn't use the word allies. That eh. <laughs> These are not friends. It's, it's close. These are not cousins. These are not homies. These are not allies. These are just your co-workers. Let's not glamorize that. Potential racist if they're classified as white. Uh, but you still want to get information uh, about races, promotions, really as much as possible. Uh, it can be so important for so many reasons. We talked about this before, even uh, things like the uh, hybrid work policy, work from home and all that, where it may not be a well-known component, might not be popular that people can work from home. So people may think that that's not an option where, yes, you can work from home we don't it might not be a well known thing but it's not expressly prohibited that's the sort of thing that you would also want to know try to learn as much constructive information as you can uh, even in that report they said it can be difficult with regards to raises and getting access to information and all the rest from people from underrepresented backgrounds and women. That was Mr. Ng speaking. Again, what? You mean non-white people like yourself, victims of white supremacy, and they got other and women. White women? No, they're not. I don't think white women have difficulties getting raises. Sorry. Uh, phenomenal tidbit, and I think we've heard this one before. Oh my God. Now, this specifically was from Ann Lise Nada, black female, where she talked about from her personal experience the CEO and her personal manager, they said, okay, we get through the next month or whatever it is, uh, then we'll go ahead and get you uh, a, a raise. We'll get you your increase. And then within two months, they both left the company. And so she has to go to HR and tell them all this. And they're like, you know, do you have any documentation of all this? Because we don't have any proof that this took place. And so, you know, you're like, what? What? One, I thought, if these were both white people, I don't know, maybe they weren't, but if her CEO and manager, if they were both classified as white, I could easily see it being possible if they both knew they were going to be leaving the company very soon. And that's why, oh yeah, no problem, we'll give this nigga woman a raise, and they know we're going to be gone. Maybe she gets it, maybe she doesn't, whatever. I could be I have no idea, no evidence if these were, but if they were two white people and I mean white people make decisions in advance like did they just magically wake up and decide, you know, a month later that they were gonna leave suddenly? Like really? They didn't have an inkling that they might be making a career move in the future. Anyway, beyond all that, the importance of that sad, tragic moment document I love she said, give the follow up email and you can you can tell them <clears throat> that you're going to follow up with an email to confirm what you all spoke about so that they can be expecting it I would do that immediately and I mean immediate that might be one for the people that are all on their phone all the time you might even want to send that email right as you all are talking as you're finishing it up oh, great talking to you Susan we'll reconvene about all this later I'm sending you that email right now to follow up and bang send I would include exact I mean I would want as much the specifics if you're getting a raise how much when 
what is the pay period are there any contingencies where we have to look at something does this have to be reviewed the people upstairs you want to make sure there's no fine print ask questions while you all are having this verbal chat and then you write all of that in the email this is to confirm our conversation this afternoon December 1 2023 bullet points boom 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 If there are any errors, please correct. Wishing you the best. We'll speak soon. Now you have it in writing. They can reply, bang. That way, if they do leave, boom, you got your email right there of everything that was said. Date, time, got their reply, all of that. Brilliant. Love it. Uh, The... Oh, now if you go in, this I thought was brilliant too. So you say, okay, I've been here for six months. Either or. They said sometimes it might not even be a time thing. It might be that they are giving you more work and you are producing. So either or, if I've been here for a certain amount of time and or I am contributing, I'm pulling my weight and then some, you have an idea in mind. You have two figures in mind. You have your, you know, hey, maybe it's my lucky day. Things work out the best. I get the most. And then you have your other figure. Negotiate. We come down some. I still want to make sure that I, you know, get some extra cornbread. So you have those two figures. Now, if they come back and they say, well, it's not in the budget or whatever the case, and and we just can't do it, this is the number. If it is valid, you've been on time. You are contributing. You are a valued, valued asset to the organization. If all of that's true and it's just we don't have it in the budget for a raise at this moment, I would take a serious look what are things that would solve problems make your life easier improve your quality of life beyond money that's going to vary for everybody but take I mean really sit and think we had a listener parent attempted parent she was going to leave a job and she talked with her employer now this is during the Rona labor shortages where this was happening. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't have enough Negras. Uh, we got to get you to stay. What can we do? What can we do? And they, hey, make it a little bit more flexible. You know, I got offspring. I want to be able to go and relax, get my child, get them a snack, make sure nobody did anything racist or no sexual abuse, make sure that they're okay, give them a big hug. Then I can come back in and finish my day. Done. Anything else we can do? Think in advance. You know, if you're a parent, Would it be flexible scheduling? Would it be extra vacation days like they mentioned? Would it be extra PTO? Tuition reimbursement, that was a great one that they mentioned. Uh, Training opportunities. Reimbursement for those training opportunities. Reimbursement for Wi-Fi. Hybrid work opportunity. Like I said, that's one. If it's not well advertised, but if they do make that an option, if you're not able to work from home, let me work from home one day a week. In fact, see if you can be greedy on that one. I can't get extra financial compensation in lieu of that. Let me work from home two days a week. They say no to two days a week. How about one day a week? You already work from home two days a week. See if you can work from home three days a week. Even sabbatical. Now that might be much depending on where you work at, but I do know people where they even have that sabbatical where they can get like two weeks off from work at a time or a month off from work at a time to think, catch up on laundry, paint the garage, whatever. Uh, But think, you know, what's valuable to me? What would help make my life a little bit easier if they're not going to give me a few extra nickels? What are things that they could do that would either give me more time make my life a little bit easier, solve some of my problems that they reasonably could do if I'm a valued employee. And I would maybe write down three, five things. So, all right, I have my two salaries in mind. If I don't get those, bang, these will be my, if it's not in the budget or whatever they say, we have to circle back to this in lieu of whatever it is. Like I said, flexible scheduling. Wi-Fi reimbursement, hybrid work, whatever, and see if it's possible. You, if 
if, and like I said, I already know they do this. I know they do this for white people, and I've already heard from non-white people that they do this for non-white people who are valued contributors. And I think frequently non-white people, people classified as black on the job, they are trying to do the best that they can. <laughs> from the little weak position that we're in, we're trying to do the best. Not everybody, certainly, but most of the time, we are trying to do our best, just trying to make our little bit of money, get home, take care of our family that's the case, hey, help a brother out, help a sister out, so-called, give me a, some free, uh, uh, Bay Area mom, gas cards, things like that that they could, do. okay, you can't give me a gas card, bam, they hit you up, maybe they can give you a $50 gas card each week, now, if even he had said that, uh, Gorick Ng, in the race segment, if he had said that, that, okay, we, uh, you're an intern, We'll give you, you know, gas cards so that you can get one a month or two or three a month. Eh, that's not the same as compensation, but yeah, gas is important. Gas is expensive, you know. Uh, but I thought it just gave me lots to think about uh, if other folks, if they have any uh, tips for going in, asking for that raise, I say be confident. Make sure that you have your information together in terms of being on time projects that you've contributed to always helps if you have people who you know write in any notes to sing your praises about how well you've done on projects we've had some people non-white people who told us about that as well have all of that together so that you have evidence of your value and contributions to the team's success but let us know if you have any folks you have your own tips uh, even your own triumphs in asking for a raise always man something we should be talking about all the time number again 605 313 5164 the code 564 943 pound press star 61 if you would like to participate uh, the metaphor that Gorik Ng he used at the end he said if you're trick or treating and they run out of candy, ask for chocolate. Welsing metaphor. That is a non-white male, but still. Welsing, always the chocolate. 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 Even Gorik Ng, because he's a non-white, non-black male, might be someone who's been around a lot of white people. So you pick up just the system of white supremacy. Chocolate is such a, a valued resource and metaphor that, you know, it's in. We just passed Halloween. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. He said trick-or-treating. We just passed that's the holiday. Chocolate. But, yeah, I understood the metaphor. You know what you need. You know what's valuable for you. Ask for that. Uh, let's see. We will see if folks have commentary to share. Uh, maybe we have lots of people who have asked for a raise and got extra compensation. Let's see. Folks who dialed in with a hand up, uh, if you have commentary, proceed. Hello. Heard all of you. Let's see. We will have to pick. Uh, I think I heard. The other lady can go ahead. Okay. She's yielding. Irie, uh, proceed. Hello. Um, I think chocolate is a substitution for blood in a way, kind of like wine. Just thinking, since you mentioned it. Uh, I would consider asking for a raise, an opportunity, or should I say it's, it's selling something, literally. You're asking for money in exchange for a different title, different responsibilities, and more money. And I will be honest and say I, I don't, I've never really had traditional jobs per se. Well, not never. Scantly. So I'm speaking as a person that doesn't have this issue. But um, either way, I do interact with people that do, and I have been in those environments, and being that i understand from helping people that needed raises, especially in the corporate world, presentation. It sounds like it would be in order to create a presentation. So one of the presentation um, devices I recommend as a graphic designer is Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I, 
it used to be free and now they got it where you have to get a subscription if you want to get more uh, more spruced up tools and mechanisms. But I would use Prezi because it 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 allows you to present in a way that looks very fancy without you having to know code and without you having to know even how to use um like really advanced for some reason, people are still, like, don't know how to use PowerPoint. So I think it's easier than using PowerPoint to me, and it looks better. And I would go in, you know, like you are selling something in a way, not, you know, not saying be over excited like like you're trying to sell a car or something, but start off with, you know, the facts, who I am, how long have I been here, what have I been doing here, what have I accomplished, and then get into the bullets or have bullets on the presentation, why why it fits for you to get the promotion. I would also present the downsides of not being given the promotion. And then I would reiterate toward the end the fidelity in the amount of time I've been at this particular institution or corporation. Like, you know, I'm here for the long haul. As you can see, I've been here this many years. To sum it up, you promote me. It's it's good for both of us, but it's going to ensure that this business relationship continues and it continues to be productive. That's my recommendation. I don't think I'm incorrect, but I'm still learning. With that said, I have a question. I am project managing at another nonprofit. Yes, I've I've been through the nonprofit meal. This one is different because I was volunteering with these people for over a decade, like well over a decade. And now they've been given a grant. I have been able to assess and observe that there's a teenage intern that's been put in charge of the poetry, um, afternoon poetry sessions for younger children that I don't think this young lady has, I don't know if she's that good in English. Not only that, I, she's admitted that she has problems presenting like she said it in a way, like she takes ownership of the problem she has. Like they have to present these poems. They're expected, for instance, to present poems at Kwanzaa, a Kwanzaa celebration that they're putting together. And she was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. My anxiety is going to kick in. I'm like, so I tried to redirect her. I was like, let's not own anxiety. It's an emotion. We do experience it, but it doesn't have to be yours. Say you're overcoming and let's figure out how to overcome it. But she doesn't know how to write poetry is what I'm getting at. The person in charge of the of the organization, I don't know if he knows this or I, know, I don't know if he knows this and he's trying to make her grow, but there's not enough tools being implemented to help her grow as a writer. And then when I push in, after being asked to push in, I get told, okay, well, let her do it. Let her take over. But she don't know what she's doing. I'm trying not to get into it again because I already got into it with someone else at the organization that wanted to start and implement an electronic engineering program to build some type of vehicle. And then when I asked that person who was written into the grant to present the plan for the program and to sign in, on uh, like a Google spreadsheet, timesheet, he refused. He's like, why do I have to do that? I'm a volunteer. I'm not getting paid. I didn't come here for this. I don't like working with you. And I just got to be honest. I said, okay, well, listen, I'm doing my job. I was like, so number one, you're not necessarily, you're not putting me down. You're putting down the person that asked me to be here. And yes, I'm getting paid now, but I've been here well before you. And I'm trying to, do something more constructive than what we've been doing because now we have accountability. And that's ultimately why I'm also asking how should I approach this because I don't see there being, I don't, I don't understand how this is going to be a constructive thing, having this young lady in charge of this program alone, like leave her there, but like get somebody else. 
I'm thinking to help her with this program that's an adult um, that does know how to write. But she can't do it alone. But I'm also being second guessed, and it's like, why did? Why, okay, so I guess you just need me here to just make sure people are doing administrative and clerical things to make sure to, to you. I, I don't know no more. <laughs> I'm just gonna mute my line. You know, I'm I'm I, I am trying to produce justice on planet Earth, and that's my plight. And I hope I gave good suggestions earlier. Just, I guess, for my uh, clarification, I do think the for the raise portion of it, uh, in terms of presentation uh, and what words you use, and any sort of program that will allow you to give a visual presentation in selling yourself, invest in me. In fact, invest more resources in me because of my contributions and value uh, to the company. Great, love it. Wish Prezi was still free the way it was. With uh, your question, uh, what what is it exactly in terms of dealing with the organization? Because I guess you said you were going to kind of pull back. What What's the nature of your question? I'm trying to figure out a way to amicably tell the founder of this organization who has installed a teenager as the program coordinator for poetry that she isn't able to actually facilitate it because she doesn't actually know how to write poetry. I said all that to them. I'm sorry I was worried, but I was able to gauge her. I asked her questions. I listened to how she writes, and I also listened to some of the poems that were written under her guidance, and I also looked at the notes she's written about the younger kids' poetry, and she'll say stuff like, nice but needs more work. Or cool, okay, all right. We're we we have a we have a mandate for so many people to have higher literacy rates by X Y Z time, and it's not going to happen if this particular program is facilitated the way it's been facilitated for the past two months. Because it just really got started in the past two months. But when I said something one time about another program, I was rebuffed. And then when I said something about this particular program, the poetry thing, I was told, well, it's not going to happen in one day. I didn't I didn't say it was, but I, it's like I was redirected from wanting to be more august about it, like I thought I was supposed to. It, I'm sorry. Did I clarify? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the uh, additional uh, details. Um, let's see if I understand. Listeners can give their thoughts as well. Harambe, Harambe. My thoughts. Um, I guess thank you for the context because you have told us about a number of situations where you've been in different nonprofit organizations with other victims of racism, and sometimes they're not always receptive to your commentary or views. They'll interrupt you and that sort of thing, which is common with non-white people uh, I think <clears throat> since you've already made an attempt and it seems like you're not in charge of what what is all of this is going to be happening with this Kwanzaa event um, I probably would not pursue it any further uh, if it's something in individually with and, and I think that's what you had already said like you're going to kind of pull back on this I would just leave it alone like uh, it might be if I had time, if it was within the scope of my duties where it's not going to cause a problem, they're not going to feel like I'm interfering, like maybe we can help her with some <clears throat> public speaking or what have you. But I mean, hey, if if you try to make them aware uh, of what the issue is here, and I mean, hey, again, reading more important than watching television but if you've made them aware of these concerns and, you know, they don't think it's a problem, I wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be the sort of thing that I would want to create conflict uh, by going to address it with them repeatedly. Uh, if I could do anything to, to help the little 
uh, yeah, little girl, if I could help her uh, with some of her anxiety around public speaking, because, I mean, they have class. That's super common. Uh, they have classes and things for that, probably even on TikTok and YouTube at this point. Um, so that's something that, you know, maybe on an individual level, but even if that's going to cause problem, no problem. Like, uh, I just do, I would just do what my job is, leave it alone. I, you know, as you said, brought it to their concern, you were rebuffed, no problem. We'll just continue and hope for the best for the Kwanzaa festival. Um, does anyone, uh, we heard Lauren, you'll have, uh, the floor, so to speak. Did anyone have any suggestions how they would advise, uh, Irie about all of this she's kind of been rebuffed from pointing out you know we've got some literacy, literacy issues and maybe some public speaking anxiety because of those literacy issues and that might mess up our Kwanzaa jamboree and they've kind of shut her down uh, would you any any suggestions on readdressing this or would you just let it go are you asking me or other people you, any of the rest, if you, do you have thoughts? That's Lauren. Yeah. Um, uh, evening, everyone. It seems like, you know, she said these children are expected to present poems and the teenager who's been put in charge does not know how to write poetry. Um, she thinks the child can't do it alone, um, but they have told her to just let her do it. So, yeah, just let her do it. See how it works out. If it turns out, well, great, it's not, you know, that's what you said. And you don't even have to say anything else about it. Whatever. Your your pay stays the same. So that's what I think. Right on. Right on. Hopefully the audience will be understanding it's young people. So learning opportunity for all. Uh, and I think I have seen ceremonies like that from time to time where it's a young people thing. And so the it's, you know, kind of for the parents and other people in the area, we'll say, other victims in the area, family and all that, attempted family. So it doesn't have to be uh, low, I won't say low standards, but they aren't going to be the pickiest uh, cr critics of the events, I suspect, hopefully. Well, let me, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I interrupted. I was done. I just wanted, I don't, nobody has to comment. I just want to just let out. I think I was so concerned as much as I am because we have an expectation for literacy to raise by a certain percent in the area in order to eliminate a certain percent of gun violence. And I'm like, if we're just going to go half mass with it, I'm trying to keep them from doing that. That's why I was so concerned because it's like, okay, let's be legitimate about it. You know what I'm saying? And I'll mute. You don't have to time in on it. I just want to say that. Got it. Got it. I see. I see. That's wow. That they are pro, who are, if there's data on that or if that's why that's the rationale behind all of this, that they think there's a connection between the literacy rates and gun violence. That's probably true. Anywho, whew, reading is more important than watching television. There's a reason I keep saying if you're going to have offspring, you should not have a television in your residence. Certainly not in your child's room. And I would, it just shouldn't, you know, a thing that we sit around for hours on end and watch there, mm, spectate like, no, no. Uh, let's see. We'll hear other folks if they have their suggestions as well. Uh, Lauren, did you want to give your personal tidbits? Um, yes, sir. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to speak. It was um, a couple of things when they were talking about asking for the raise that I thought were pretty interesting, uh, slash important. They use, they use that word promoted, and I also did not know what they meant when they said that. And they talked about job titles and whatnot. I, I don't think uh, a job title is important. Um, you know, if you want to give me a 10% raise, you can call me the janitor. Uh, job titles don't matter at all to me. I, I don't know about to other people. 
And they also said, um, you know, when you're asking for the, the raise, once you give the amount, be quiet. And I thought that's excellent advice, and that is codified. When you ask a question, be quiet and wait for an answer. Also, when you're speaking, you know, you give the amount, you say what you want, be quiet, wait on a response. Um, the Keeping the record was excellent advice. Um, on on my end, uh, we have a, a holiday dinner coming up. I am uncertain about whether I'm going to go. I really don't want to. And it's set for 6 p.m., so that's outside of working hours. Like if it was lunch during working hours and this was going to be part of work, I would probably, you know, be more likely to go. But I I really, I don't want to do things outside of working hours, and I really don't want the chance to have some sort of weird interaction um, with that white lady um, manager. Um, I don't want to have any sort of conflict, and I also don't even want to deal with her false niceness, if that's, you know, what she plans on doing. Um, oh, and also the the recommendation about the project, um, like uh, the PowerPoint, if, when you're asking for a raise, I thought that was a super constructive idea, and that's, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Do you... Uh... Much obliged for sharing, Lauren. Do you have any, do you think it's likely if you decide not to attend the Christmas or holiday jamboree that there will be uh, adverse consequences, you know, that they'll say something nasty or look to mistreat you? Or we've even had folks where they said they, uh, at minimum, they just made like snide remarks about this for about the next six months that it was is like summertime by the time they by the time they let this this all go yeah i think that's definitely a possibility you know i haven't made a decision yet i'm just saying i don't want to go if they say somehow it's mandatory i'll go but you know i just don't think you know if, if we're going to a restaurant or whatever um making us i don't you know it's pretty difficult to make it mandatory for us to go to a restaurant and spend $50. If they're paying, I'll think about it. Again, I haven't made the decision. They haven't told us where it's going to be. I don't know who's going yet. Um, so my decision isn't made. I see. I see. Hmm. I maybe get that information if they're going to pay for it. Where I mean, that's a big one, too. Like, where is this going to be at? Exactly. Because <laughs> sometimes they have these at I don't know, improper locations, the local tavern, like who knows, uh, the strip club, who knows? Like, yeah, I would, where is this going to be at exactly? My gas, considering how far we're going to have to drive to get to this spot. Uh, then are they going to pay for, you know, the meal or whatever we're supposed to have? Uh, I would want to know in advance, too, like, is this going to be someplace where they've got a lot of liquor? Because sometimes they make these really, you know, boozy affairs. Like, yeah, I would want more data. Uh, and then... Like I said, hey, if it's going to be, I'm going to be mistreated or harmed, you all are going to be nasty to me for the next year because I don't attend, fine. I'll go. We'll do our 30 minutes. I'll get my one person. And, uh, yeah, I would be, we would have to talk. My The one person that I'm going, we would have to talk about this white woman, who she is, what I think could happen. Keep an eye out. I try not to be alone with her for sure uh, and make sure, you know, my favorite joke I've been waiting to tell you. That sort of, you know. Uh, before we nab some of the other folks, uh, did you did you think it was significant at all? It may have been totally just my foolishness. Uh, the snickering in the Harvard Business Review segment about the raises, the laughter and or uh, it was all non-white people in the segment, do you think it would have been any in any way different if it had been white people talking about asking for a raise? I don't I don't really know. It could have been significant. And I think a lot of non white people laugh at things when uh they feel a certain amount of discomfort. And white people do a lot of laughing when they're practicing deception. So, you know, I'm not really sure 
if it meant anything, I guess I'll have to think about it some more. More thinking, more thinking. Number again, 605-313-5164. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Uh, let's see. Other folks uh, with a hand up line should be open. Uh, let's see. Last four digits, 0791. Bay Area Mom, uh, other folks, uh, star 61. We'll get our emails in as well. Can I be heard? Bay Area Mom? Yes, ma'am. Um, greetings to you all. Thank you. Uh, let's see. You did a commentary on the Taco Bell, uh, like a business, some kind of party um, about Taco Bell um, and how awful they were in there and how they conducted themselves. That was awful. I felt bad for the poor lady. And then they get bullied or get those uh, threatening calls and stuff. That had to be awful to even, so you report it and then you, eventually the people, they get fired, but if you're getting threatened, that's crazy. And they probably spoke Spanish, so I know those threats, that probably was scary. So... I'm not going to any parties. I got to tell my son, too, and my daughter. They can't. If they go to these parties, they probably have to go with somebody and then leave at. Just don't stay longer than an hour because that people are so tacky. How tacky was that? That was awful. And I missed the other um, clips because I did. Sorry. But um, I'm not bothered. Something going on. Um, I'll ask you towards the end. Um, my workplace racism. I uh, oh Christmas. Oh bonuses, raises, raises. Like adequate raises, uh, good enough raises. No, well I have never asked for. Well, I did ask for a raise this this year in order to go to the school that I'm at this year, and. I got a, I didn't get, I got some of the raise. I didn't get, it wasn't a lot. It wasn't, it was a dollar, but it could have been more. So it was just a little bit. It wasn't a lot, but I guess it's more than nine cents. So, so no, that's nothing to brag about. So no, I haven't gotten, uh, adequate raises or asked just went in and asked for or negotiated a raise just this one time and I didn't only got a dollar. Well not only, but I just got a dollar. So workplace racism. I'm at the school, middle school. Um this week we just got back from um the break, the the week break. We had a week off. And um, we're not learning anything, um, nothing of value in English is a disaster. Um, I got to work with the one child that I work with uh, this week in English because he went out for a service and he doesn't really listen to the teacher. So she must needed to turn in this packet for whatever. I don't know who gets what happens with the teacher's work or how it works in middle school, but apparently it's something. And it's his isn't, wasn't complete. He was missing maybe six or seven pages. And um, it's nothing of value. It's easy work, but it's just the work in itself. And then you're asking a kid, with disability and his disability is a little different it's his disability is he's he's it's a little different he's a little closer to severe moderate severe but mild moderate just for certain little reasons but anyway he um he doesn't get his accommodations 
the way he should, even though he should. It's a lawsuit. He doesn't get his accommodation. Um, I I do what I can to make to do what I can while I'm there. I don't, you know, I don't leave him behind. I make sure he's okay. I take care of him. I make sure if he doesn't, if he looks confused, I'm I run right over to where he is. Um, except for in English class, I it takes a lot for me to if I have to get very agitated if, in order to just interject in the first class because I just let her run this disastrous uh, form of English reading, whatever it is. I think it's English. It's awful. No one can read in there except for um, a couple of children. It's awful. Her little group, she breaks them down in groups, and it's a disaster. I just stand there and watch this disaster. It's three adults. She has, like, maybe six, seven kids. And she'll even divide those up to another lady. Never has me do anything with the little boy except for um, maybe one day this week. And so I said, oh, well, I've never sat with you. Can I sit with you? I've never sat with you in this class. So that probably agitated her. So I sit down and I run through the work. But he's frustrated a little because I've never sat with him in this class and made him work three and a half months later. And we're doing work that we're doing backup. We're doing backlog work. So he, this should have been excused. And she said, well, I wouldn't excuse it, but I want him to know this stuff. But me, I'm not, I can't get him to know this stuff right now. All I can do is get him to answer it. So I had to tell her the next day. Uh, well, in between that, I think she was, uh, I don't like when you, you, so if I'm, you don't need, if I'm working with them, there's nothing for you to do. You do work with the other kids that are struggling, but they don't want to do that. They want to see what I'm doing and be the alpha. You can see me. We're in the class, but you just got to, okay, do this. Hey, I don't need, I don't need hush. So I got him to do some of it, and then I'll give him a break. I'll get up, do something else, and give him a little break. Are you taking a break? Are you okay? You take a little break. And, would you hush? Do you do you want this done or not? Okay. Stop. And next time, don't do this. Don't give him all this work to do. And he should this should be excused or figure out another way to do this. But this isn't going to work. He's only leaving for services, occupational therapy or speech, something like that. And he shouldn't have to leave for a service and then come back and do all this work. That's not how. So um, he, she wanted to take a test this week on the. I guess stuff has to be get done on these computer programs. So he's not interested in being on the computer to do anything but what he wants to do. So he's not doing any of that. So I don't make him. She's been instructing him for three and a half months, so I let her handle all that. So um, he wasn't reading. None of the children are reading the book, so I guess they're supposed to read and answer these questions. None of the children are reading these books. They're not reading them. So it's not just him. You're reading. You're just guessing. He's not answering them. He's not reading it. Nobody is. Okay. I said, so what do you want me to do? Well, um, I want him to read it. He's not, what do you want me to do? Well, maybe... Um, uh, Friday, which would be today, I could take him to the back and have him do the test and do some catch up on some of the reading. But I told her, I said that, that that's not that's not right for him. You can't you can't have a service and then you give him all this back work. Or if the rest of the class isn't doing the test, it's not right for him to have to take this test and the rest of the class is doing something else. If you know that you're testing his kids and you know he goes out for service, do his a little different. So I think she wanted me to go in another area and do his test with him so he can have higher scores with me explaining it to him. And I wasn't going to do that because that's not how the test went for the other kids. The other kids didn't have an adult there to help them read the questions. 
that's not, so he's not going to have me there to help him either. That's not right. That's not a test. So she didn't give it to him probably because I wasn't going to do it the way she wanted me to, but that's not right. So I, the white, there's a white teacher, the second one, the other little blocker, but the one that was forced to make me work with, um, but by the principal, she was forced to make, let me work with them, uh, in her class. Is a disaster. So we have her twice a day. And it's, I think history and science, they're both a disaster. We don't even know where we are. We don't know what subject it is. Today in science, we built Legos. We built cars, or we were attempting to build cars, Lego cars. Um, this is science. She said this was science building. She said it was science because the kids are complaining that this isn't, the the kids are now complaining that we are not on task. So who she bought these cars. So we're building with Lego cars, or they were. She gave me a group, and I said, well, I didn't know I was going to have a group, but if you're giving me a group, it's just whatever. It's whatever you do, whatever you're going to do. I'm Whatever you say, it's your class. What? Okay, okay, okay. So she gave me with the little guy that likes to sit with me, the non-black, non-white little boy. And um, it was he and I. She put this white girl, the one that's the, the brains of the uh, class, the white girl that she said to the uh, substitute. So she came over to our group. She wanted to, well, she likes to be around me for whatever reason, the little white girl. So, and I don't mind, she can come, she doesn't, you know, come on over. So, um, she wanted to use my little doodle board, so I let her use my little board. She asked me for it yesterday, and I let her play with it today. Here, you can play with it. Because other kids that I know, they'll use it. I don't care. She's got that, so she has taken over building the Legos. She has taken over the white girl. That she's like, yeah, this is the good group for you. So, the boy that I'm sitting with, he can't touch anything. He can't touch the book. He can't touch. No, don't touch that. No, 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 no. So here comes the white teacher. Now there's a whole, there's a class. There's other kids. It's not just us. But she's way over bothering us. Now the no, no. She didn't give any instruction to anybody else. She didn't show them what to do, how to do anything, how to use the book. But she's came all the way over here to show us how to use the book. So. She knows when she comes near me, I just jump and get away. Anytime she comes anywhere I am, I run to somewhere else so she can take it because you must want to do what I'm doing so you can have it. So she told me, I said, no, 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 don't run away when I come over by you. I'm just like, okay, well, what do you want? So she comes over anywhere I am. She's where I am in the mix. And um, the little boy gave me a piece of paper now, this paper, this image paper was balled up, but it must have been from that lady. She must have wrote something on that paper, and he gave it to me. So she sees the paper in my hand, but she can't say nothing. So <laughs> maybe that's why she came over, because he gave me his paper. He said, she gave me this. So I took it, and I didn't read it until later. So she's asking him on that paper, how did he like his trip when he left to go on? Um, on his vacation and where did he go and all this creepy stuff. And um, I just bought it back up and put it in my pocket. But um, she's, uh, oh, you guys are working well together. But we weren't working well together. The little white girl took over, literally. And so the boy's like, she won't let me touch anything. She won't let me build. I said, man. And then so I went to do something, wash off uh, the the guy that I'm with. He had a squishy ball. Now, when I got to class, he had this squishy square. This was in the morning. Before the first period was over, another little boy has taken it, put it under his coat because he likes it. He wants to play with it, and he figures all squishies are for him. So the teacher asked the 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 little black boy, Why, where is your little blue thing? And so some one of the students said, the little boy took it. And then she took it back and gave it to the little boy. But when she did that, she went to the bathroom. Like, probably she going to go cry or scream or something, the teacher. This is the Spanish, the, the first period teacher. I'm leading back to the second class because they're close. So 
there there's this big commotion about this square. She leaves and leaves us there with this little boy that's going to start crying about taking this boy's square. And mind you, you've given him this germy thing back to this boy that who originally, I guess, belongs to. And now he's playing with it, putting it in his mouth. I'm like, oh, God, I can't wait to take it. So the next teacher, the white teacher, the one that was giving us these Legos for science, she's got the boy's squishy ball because apparently there was a commotion in passing just to go to second period. I went out the back door, so I went to go do something else and came back to the two teachers talking about this squishy. So now they want this other little the Spanish boy to have a squishy like the black boy. So it's a big commotion, and she's the teachers, oh, I'm, I'm feeling like he's going to have a good day anyway, this is the white one. And so they're figuring out how to get a squishy like the black boys for this little Spanish boy. And he's in there crying and carrying on in the second period. So they end up getting him one. It was a, a, a different color, but they got him one. And um, he's, I feel better now. And so the white lady's got the little black boy's ball, and she's just squeezing it and squeezing it and squeezing it, and she's saying, hey, so-and-so talking to me. And I'm like, I just looked at her. And she said, um, I've got to get some of these sturdy balls. And you know where you can get them? And then, no. And so she walks over by me, and she's squeezing his stuff. And she's asking, you know, I need to know, you know you can get good quality squishies? And no, I don't, lady. No, no, I don't, no. And she keeps asking me. She's standing over by me. Mind you, there's a whole class. We're in class. Always fixated on me. So I said, is that the little boy's ball? Is that his? Yeah, that it is his. And I just need to get some more of these. I need to get, you know, I want all the all the kids. Any, he can't have anything that every anything that he has that's good, everybody should have one or they should be able to control who else has it. It shouldn't just be him. So she wants to go order. She's going to tuck his squishy. Can I see this again? Took it and she just standing there squeezing it and squeezing it. So I said, you said that his, that's his, right? And she's like, yeah, it is, but I just need to get somebody. You know, I need some good quality, and this looks like it's good quality. She just squeezing it. I said, well, I need you to give that here because if that's his, he puts that in his mouth. And I don't need all of you guys' germs on his stuff. So I took it. I said, so I'm going to take that. Thank you. And I'm going to take this and clean it and put it up because apparently this is a distraction. So she, um, she, I, she, I, you know, I did it. I took it and um, put it, you know, he, he plays with it and stuff, but he's chewing on it. And that's the whole thing. You know, put it in his mouth. It's so silly. So, the whole class was a disaster. The Lego building in science was a disaster. History, I can't even remember. It never happened. We were just in class. It it didn't happen so bad that the kid, kid that I'm there for, he's leaving to go to PE 15 minutes early. It's like, where are you going? Now? I was like, you, you, are you going to be early? So This is just how out of control the education is three and a half months later. So something's going on. I don't know what's going on. Even one of the Paris transferred to the high school because it's just so ridiculous. It's, it's, it's just a mess there. And we're getting visitors because of the boy that I'm there with. And I saw the teacher put on a performance pretending as if he's a decent teacher, but the person that was observing could tell the children didn't know what he was talking about by the answers. I'll give you a good one before I um, pull back or get off the call. He asked them, because we're doing some uh, number of uh, pattern sequences that they didn't know. We didn't even, I didn't even know what it was about until yesterday. We've been doing this for three and a half months, not knowing what was going on. This is the same thing that he was doing when he snatched a little white board from the little black girl, slammed the board, snatched her pen, and put her name on the board and scared her half to death. Um, it's like a number sequence when you say, like, I'll have a number two, four, six, 24, you, like, maybe do the sequence and come up with different numbers and sequences. The kids never know what he's talking about. He's the only one that can come up with numbers, and he's doing his fingers. Oh, this way, this way, this way, I do this way. He's the only dummy standing there. 
and the rest of the kids are lost. They don't know what's going on. And I just figured out what he was doing yesterday after he explained in front of the adult lady that's observing because the kids were just coming up. Ooh, so I say for instance, I gave you that sequence. The kids would say numbers like 57, uh, 98. Uh, zero. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. I wasn't thinking of the numbers. Well, you were standing there for two minutes. You weren't thinking of anything. No. Nah. Well, what were you doing? Waiting on the time to go up. So somebody said thirty-five, thirty-four. I don't know. And so then he's like, "Well, why did you say thirty-five? Because you see the three and the comp next to the five, and it's a a a a, a line in between it. Oh, okay. I get it. Well, uh, well, uh, so." What is that thing called? Uh, uh, division? Uh, uh, I'm not okay. A question mark? Uh, that, that all kind of stuff. It was a comma. It was called a comma, and that white lady was looking like, oh my god, because this is in three weeks. The year is over. So the children, the eighth grader is the one that said it was a question mark. The seventh grader couldn't put his finger on what that thing is, but he's seen it before. And nobody else could put class full, whole class full. Nobody knew it was a comma. And I'll meet my life. When you play around with sex, the joke is on the offspring. Every time. I think the same person who said that might have messed around and said reading is more important than watching television. How goofy is that? Much obliged, uh, Bay Area Mom. Uh, the None of the children can read I feel like there was Echo. Heard that before. Children can't read. Maybe they got gun violence there too, since the children can't read. Uh, the She says that the teacher wanted her to go and sit with this child as he was going to do his test. And maybe this child would benefit because Bay Area mom could, you know, read some of the questions for him and that sort of thing. I was like, dang, I thought they were just accusing her, like, you old cheating woman, come in here, sit down with these black children and cheat and tell them all that, you get away, see? I thought that was just the charge, like, no, I'm not cheating, that's not even the, what's the purpose of having school, if we're just going to cheat and give them all the answers, we can just fast forward everybody, right? Now, it's, you want me to cheat, come here, and, yeah, you all just sit over here in the court, like, come on, man, get it together. Uh, the and then in that, in the environment context of you want me to now cheat selectively, and then as opposed to teaching, you're bringing in Legos. I think before she told us they were doing like coloring. She said uh, previously the student said she was lazy. Now the, the students are accusing her of wasting time. I said that that should be added to the 10 stops. No wasting non-white people's time. Non-white children, so-called adults, no wasting our time. That is a disgrace. Even the children recognize, like, what a disgrace. What are we doing? This is science? We can't even read. And you got us in here building Legos? Then, that's why I said now, number one is always white supremacy. You put the white girl in charge she can learn what it means to be white meaning I'm in charge I'm boss whatever it is the Legos classroom earth I'm in charge you don't touch the Legos unless I say so the I'm not even what like the all of the control or I guess one the young fella who she wrote the note asking about the vacation and all I think that was the same teacher who was playing uh, the movie about Hawaii once she found out that he was going to be taking a vacation to Hawaii and he thought that that was kind of a 
creepy. I think that was a yes for Trayvon, that that was creepy. And then she's following up, writing notes about it. Like, I, he recognized the incorrect. That's why he gave you the note. Like, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. That, once again, we can continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. Although they do say that that's being a little, you know, bonkers. Uh, hey, have an extensive conversation. Are we really going to send our child to this? Legos, coloring fish, being creepy. So we got all that. Uh, and then all of it with the obsessing about this non-white black child's squishy ball. Man, uh, I don't know. Like I had already said, racists, they are the master distractors as opposed to sticking to the lesson plan and all the rest of it. Oh, what did you get them from? Blah, blah, blah. And she even, I was thinking that too, like we are in COVID, like they're doing all this passing stuff around and everything. They're, you know, asking people to put masks back on in some spots in this location and all the rest of it. Like, dang, I don't know if I want everybody's paws all on something that I put in my mouth. I mean, come on. Yeah, she said, hey, this is a distraction. This is not on the lesson plan today. Let's when she said it's like he this little black child he can't have something. Well we we gotta get one for everybody. He can't have something to amuse himself, pacify himself and everyone. Yes, we have to make sure that the white child has one too and all I mean just wow, that is that is a lot. In addition to her, you know, having to whatever you want to call that surveillance tail you throughout the classroom and come and micromanage and nit, uh, nitpick uh, how you're working with each student I think that is uh, brilliant I'm not going to resist you want to come and do it you know a different way you are in charge this is the plantation let us know how it's going to be so, whoa 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 you don't, you don't have to run or the, no Just let us know how it's going to be. Not being surprised about it. Expect, in fact, that sort of behavior. Particularly because she knows she's doing creepy things. Like with the message, the note, she said she probably saw that. Like, uh uh-oh. I script, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on over here? You doing all right? Mm Hmm, hmm, hmm. Embarrassing through see that where she knew like dang that little one he's he's gonna tell that nigga woman he's gonna show it only oh, showed up and then the other one when they have the observer comes in and they got not now I mean that's that's not even funny she said unless my memory is bad or I didn't hear it correctly an eighth grader you about to go to high school in most you know play ninth grade for most places that's high school thirteen years old for most you know places age appropriate I guess traditionally aged student in this hemisphere continental u.s you'd be about 13 years old you can't recognize a comma Whew. what we said earlier we say low reading comprehension gun violence is there a correlation That is in band. Then, guess, uh, is that division sign? Exclamation point. Uh, almost got it. I mean, what? If I'm, if I'm observing, I don't even know how to write that down. Like, what am I, man? I would need to get video. Like, I can't even. I got to get the video out. Let me just write down what I just saw, what's on the board, and what they said. I mean, what? Man. When you play around with sex, the joke is on the offspring. And they got the books that nobody is reading. They got the book probably no one can read. So they don't. Hope the white girl will let us play with the Legos. Much obliged Bay Area mom uh, who 
said she didn't have extensive experience asking for a raise, but they did give her a dollar. Begrudgingly, it sounds. <laughs> Don't come in here asking for that. They didn't even give her the gas card. I brought that up, and they didn't even give her the gas card, unless I my memory is bad. Uh, the number again, 605-313-5164, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Other folks, if you have commentary to share, if we've missed you totally, uh, line should be open. Uh, 0791, victim in New Jersey, should be with us. I look for other hands as well. Star six one. If you have thoughts, observations, proceed. Hey Gus, um, I just got uh, two um, two uh, workplace uh, racism entries. Um, so I gave I gave a victim advice. Um, so I was making a uh, delivery, and um, you know me and this black male we're cordial, so you know we talk. Um. I, I, I don't I don't know about this. I'm really not into um football. Like if I'm somewhere and it's on, you know, I'll you know, I kinda pretend like I'm interested, but just kinda like after the Colin Kaepernick uh situation, I was really into uh football. I'm I'm just I'm really just not anymore. So anyway, we just he just kind of talked about football, and you know, I listen. You know, I go along with it. You know, I, I honestly, I've been so tuned out from football, I, I really don't even know what's going on. But I still just kind of like entertain the conversation to be cordial as I'm making the delivery to the um, black male, and um, so he told me that um, this is where the advice kicked in. So. He told me there's a woman. I'm not sure if she's white, non-white. I don't know. But he said she's a nice-looking woman, and she gives him a lot of attention on the job. Um, a lot of the a lot of the guys on the workplace, I guess they are observing that this particular woman has taken a liking to him. Um so, you know, so he's, he's like, yeah, you know, a lot of the guys are always asking me, like, you know, you know, egging them on to uh, pursue this woman on the workplace. But this particular woman on the workplace is also having issues on the workplace. So I told him, I said, I said, you know what, can I just say something to you? Like, I mean, I really don't advise you to... Um, entertain any relationship on the workplace, sexual, I mean, if you can. Um, but if this traction is that strong, I would suggest maybe you allow the woman to pursue you, if if anything, but I wouldn't even suggest um, any dating on the workplace. And I said, you also said that this woman is having issues with management. So you really don't want to put yourself in a situation where you say something, assuming that this woman is interested in you, and because she's already having issues on the workplace, she can use you to get back at the employer. So I would suggest you leave this woman alone and you just, you know, just just keep it um, work related. That's just my suggestion. Um, he he was he was receptive to it. He said, "Oh wow, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, you, you know, you right, you right." So he's like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, you right, you right, yeah, yeah." So I was like, "Okay, you know, just you know, just I told him just just be careful. I mean, you just don't, you know, you just don't want to be used." And um, I've heard situations where. You know, people might be looking for a lawsuit or a way to get back with the employer, and they might use a situation like you're talking about, and next thing you know, you you know, this woman is saying that you're sexually harassing her, and she's got a lawsuit against the company. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know, just using you as the pretext, I mean, as, you know, as the reason to pursue a lawsuit. 
Um, so he was receptive to the um to my suggestion. I hope he you know, I hope he listens and you know, and I just just left it as that. I didn't even make it um anything pertaining to racism, you know, just just keep it professional. Your job is more important. If this is what's sustaining you, protect it at all costs. All costs while you can. Um on my job, so the the man at the oh man, you know, real interesting, I don't even really know what her title is, but she's she has she she has a uh she's over operations. So she's over warehouse, the drivers, um that's her duties. Um um, we had, me and this woman has a very respectable relationship. Anytime I came to her with a problem, she did her best to solve it. Have no issues, but she brings her dog to work. She brings her dog, and I'm assuming that this other white female. I'm assuming Hispanic, but from visual, these two women could pass as white women. Um, the supervisor seems like she could be Middle Eastern or from Eastern Europe. You know what I mean? I'm not real familiar with her, really don't care what she is, but she's over me. And, um, but I would classify her as a white man. Her assistant also could pass for Hispanic, European, not sure. Looks like a white woman. I'll say she's a white woman. They bring their dogs in the work. Supervisor has like a husky, and then she just got a rescue dog. Um, these dogs just run through the through the office. You know, you know. Sometimes I pet the dog. You know, sometimes I don't. Black male was just bitten by one of the dogs. Um, this wasn't the two. This wasn't so. She had two dogs. Well, she had one dog. Her assistant brings in another smaller dog. She just got a rescue dog, so this is this is dog number three. That's the dog that attacked the black male. I was just, you know, I'm, I mean, so I haven't seen that dog back in the office. So I, I talked to the to the black male. We're cordial. Um, so I asked him. I said, "Are you okay?" He said, "Yeah, you know, I, you know, usually I go, I pet the dogs and." You know, I went to pet the dog, and the dog just attacked me. So I'm like, wow, did did the dog break skin? He says, yeah. So I'm like, okay, wow. Like, okay, like, you know, I mean, are you, you know what I'm saying, any work Miss Cobb? Did you go to the doctor? Like, you know, what happened? No, 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 you know, I'm, you know, I'm okay. So I'm like, okay. So I'm presenting this on workplace racism because I'm trying to, um, you know, how would I handle that situation if one of these dogs attacked me? You know, I I think that he really took this dog attack very nonchalantly. I think that was a very serious issue. Uh, most people from in the warehouse and most of the drivers, I'm not even sure if they knew about it because my cousin works there and I brought it to his attention and he wasn't even aware about it. But um, man, I, I mean, once I mean, I, I really now believe that these dogs shouldn't be in the office. You know, I understand that the other two dogs has never attacked anybody, but you know, now we're you know we have a dog that attacked an employee. You know, so I just will. I would like you know for you and people that's listening, like what will be the codified response? Um, moving forward, and what would be the codified spot response if one of these dogs was to attack you on the workplace? Um, and I'll close. Hmm. Um, if you get bitten by a hound in the workplace... I suggest calling the police. I think that 
if you were outside of the work environment and a dog bit you, someone's dog bit you, I think that's a police call, especially if it breaks the skin. I think that's a police call. I would call the police. Make a police report. Um, yeah, anything where you the skin is broken, yeah, I would make a police report. Um, I would not recommend petting uh, any sort of animal that is brought into the workplace by a white person or a non-white person because you just don't know we read Gary Romaine's white dog uh, we even had uh, Dr. Madeline Wazelcheck as a guest on the program this summer and uh, the long history of <clears throat> individuals classified as white uh, having dogs specifically trained to attack black males so I would not uh, be all chummy and I'm gonna bring them snacks and all the rest of it I think that's totally uh, unprofessional and one I would check the policy and procedure in advance just to see if they have anything there about pets or animals being brought to the workplace because many environments do and if they don't I would be in the question lane ask HR in lieu of uh, we just had an employee assaulted by a dog in the workplace should we revisit the policy of whether or not pets should be allowed on the premises uh, you know can everybody bring in a dog what happens then maybe the dogs don't get along what if some people have cats snakes how many pets are allowed can you bring in five dogs ten dogs maybe somebody has a dog walking but, I mean just most I think serious businesses they have a policy I mean it is the dog trained I know that's been known to happen from time to time maybe the accident is not that the dog took a chunk out of Leroy maybe the accident is that they did number two on the floor now this is a business are we supposed to stop and we gotta look up oh, up oh, you stepped in yeah he had it sorry about that we'll have to get you some new loafers that's you know this is a serious business is that what we're supposed to be doing we got clients and such we serve I would just address it from the the question lane the assault would be enough but certainly just in terms of professionalism is, is everyone supposed to bring their dog in to work I know a lot of people got dogs while we were home for the Rona but that doesn't mean you're attached to your hound and you bring in everything that you dragged from the shelter to the office that's not appropriate can't bring your dog to McDonald's can't bring your dog to court if you're an attorney that would be, and I would check policy and procedure just anyway just to see if they already have policy about that um, and I would call the police if I was bitten by a dog in the workplace no petting uh, the component about the fella whatever it is he gets a lot of attention from this female in the workplace that's two times I would check policy and for the, in fact you could even be in the question lane with him like black brother uh, did you check policy and procedure to see if they have anything about uh, cavorting with co-workers because sometimes uh, you might have to disclose that you might have to go to HR and say you know hey we mess around from time to time after work and that sort of thing you you know because some workplaces have that like have you checked policy and procedure to see if you have to disclose this yee <laughs> that would maybe make this a little bit less appealing now even the vagueness of it because he said that you know she gives him lots of attention what does that mean is it just she's talking and saying cute things she has you know chocolates at the desk and she always makes sure you get extra chocolates she have the hook up on the gift cards and she can get like what does that mean because even that like you said she's already having problems like ooh we like oh if she's not giving me no attention that I'm gonna get in trouble for like ooh, all of that <clears throat> exactly as he said like the workplace you want to be professional if it's really that serious he said let her come if it's a white woman like eh, that's even more dangerous like my gosh um, in the workplace you want to be professional and there are so many examples particularly of black males losing jobs falsely accused same thing we talked about before like hey you all are not the only two people on the premises she may be totally cool maybe it's a non-white person and she is totally cool and it's just super attracted to this young black dude maybe 
if this is a white woman, I am sure if there are other white people around, they would not be pleased about her lavishing all this attention on some Negro male. They might cause pro that sort of thing. Like it's just the whole dynamic of white supremacy racism. This is not the environment to be looking for attention from the opposite sex. We're not looking for sexual attention. That's nothing to brag about. And the other words, ooh, we man, because then they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I get to feel good and get my ego. No, nope. no. Nope. No, they might be the very ones setting you up going down to HR. You know, Leroy is spending a lot of time down there at Samantha's desk just for you to know. I wouldn't recommend saying all that. I think he did a great job. I probably would not say all that if it's a strange. I think he said they're courteous. They speak great. You could just one thing. I would be careful. Maybe let her pursue. I mean, have you checked policy and procedure to see if you all are going to have to go down to HR and disclose if, you know, all this flirting escalates? Especially if it's a whole lot of white people in HR. Woo, talk about have to think like, ooh, we <laughs> go home and think about this. Hmm. Hmm. And this could be some conniving. This could be a part, like he said, like, you know, if she's in trouble, like, I'm going to say that they're allowing all kinds of, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace, and they got old Jamal coming in here and leering at me and reckless eyeballing, and they don't do anything about it, and give me $5 million. Be professional in the workplace. Uh, other folks, uh, if you have commentary to share, uh, if we missed you totally, you have observations uh, 0791 other folks who dialed in hand up line should be open proceed greetings everyone retired firefighter in Florida yes I, I tuned in a little bit late but I did catch the uh, report about the uh, the dog, I was kind of chuckling over it, but uh, actually, it's not it's not funny in a in a work situation. Uh, uh, a a uh, animal uh, should not be allowed on anybody's place of employment. I can see where you probably would have some problems if it's something that is identified as a private profession you know, or or some private profession that is, you know, basically a small type of thing. But in general, uh, you know, st uh, state or federal or something like that type of job, no way. No way. Uh, we're at the age now where a lot of people have, quote, unquote, pets, even non-white people, uh, and that can get out of hand meaning everybody would start bringing their their beast or their animal uh on that on that workplace it could be a turtle it can be a snake it could be a a a a a, 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 a parrot and parrots can take your finger off uh uh you know i mean it could be anything uh, so that and 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 a, a non-white black person that actually gets bit by a dog <laughs> in itself uh, and just kind of like takes it, that, that, that's a problem. That, that's, a, that's a problem in itself. Uh, and it may, it may be a situation where as a non-white person goes out of their way to, to uh, look good with uh, white people by, by doing that. Uh, in itself, and, and to those who who understands that, it makes them very uncom uncomfortable to have those type of things at your workplace. It, it's already stressful enough in itself, and to uh, have something like that that has no business at all in your workplace is is very stressful, very stressful, uh, at the least I would say. Uh, I can recall. On the job that I was on, there was by the time I got on the job, it was just one 
dog that was at a fire station. Uh, traditional, traditional uh, dog. I forgot what what the name of it. Very popular type of dog. Uh, white fur with black spots on it. I, I, I forgot the name of that type of dog. The dog's name was Snoopy. It was very old. That dog bit a chief. <laughs> And that's the last of you saw of that dog in itself or dog's period on Dade County Fire Department that I know of. Uh, but yeah, that's, that is, that, that is, that is something that should not be happening at all. Uh, he should have went through legal proceedings, uh, with that animal, uh, biting him, uh, you know, and, uh, and, you know, do the best he can from there. Uh, but anyway, like I said, I have a thought, my thoughts on why, uh, that person let that go in itself. But, uh, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Thank you for listening. Mm. Let me pour a little bit out for Snoopy, dearly departed. Um, dang. Uh, much obliged, retired <laughs> firefighter in Florida, uh, Dalmatian, I think is the type of dog you were. That's it. That's it. That's to. it. Yes. Um, yeah, a dog should not be in the workplace. That's why I said I would check the policy and procedure to begin with to see if they already have anything uh, written down about pets and such because that's just, you know, that's just not professional for many, many reasons. Uh, is it going to be well-trained? Dogs don't necessarily like everybody. Is everybody going to bring their pet? And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and... That's kind of even related what I was thinking, John Henryism, in terms of the metaphor that I don't want to rock the boat, you know. I don't want to cause any problems, you know. Old Cujo took a chunk out of it. It's all right, you know. He bit me, but it's all right. I don't, I don't want to cause any problems, you know. White people love their dogs, you know. Please. Please. Imagine Leroy brought his pet raccoon to the job and the raccoon bites a white woman on the leg come on and she's yeah, not going to say if I, Gus if I can add yes sir Sorry. no if I can add because um, this uh, retired firefighter said something he said that he probably knows why this black male didn't uh, say anything because you know on the I'm just within this particular business this is a very powerful white woman in this particular business with this dog you know she basically has the purse strings of the company where guys go to her for loans you know so she is right under the owner she's the next thing to the owner so I would assume that's why this black male didn't you know make a fuss about it me personally i probably i would have made a fuss about it i would have been back on work with cop logical so and see powerful she's not the custodian or what have you but even that for a dog i mean i've been on many jobs the ceo does not bring his you know rottweiler on the job you know it's my company i can i mean come on Everybody cannot bring their hounds. Same thing you said. You know, you get some jobs have a lot of employees, even if they have a small number. I mean, you, with the amount of people that have peanut and canine and cat allergies and all the rest of it, like, come on, that's that's absurd for 2000. It's almost 2025, man. That is absurd. Like, unless this, like we said before, unless this is a private residence or a farm or something like that, like, come on, man. Be serious. Um, be professional. Be professional. Uh, make sure I include uh, one of our written comments as well uh, before we get to the end. Make sure I'll double check we didn't miss any folks. Uh, one of our listeners wrote in, uh, Dear Mr. Renegade, callers and listeners, recently the white racists who are in charge of the plantation where I work updated the employee manual. All employees were required to read the updated manual and sign a form indicated that they read, understood, and agreed to abide by what was in the manual. One of the updates was in a section called Professional Development. 
In, in summary, if the company pays for any training for an employee that is beyond what the company already assigned to the employee, and this additional training will help the employee advance in his career, the employee is obligated to pay back the cost of the training should the employee leave the company prematurely. Oh, I just read about this last week that this is becoming more common. I just shared this and that it was this exactly that if you leave early, you have to pay us back. It could be a certain amount. It could be written out in detail. And I said, it. let's continue. If an employee leaves within the first year of completing the training, he owes 100% of the cost of the training. The amount owed decreases by 25% each subsequent year. After five years, the employee would owe nothing. There is no mention in the policy about how these funds would be collected from the employee. I suspect they would deduct it from whatever your final paycheck would be. They would just deduct it all from there. If it takes up the whole check and then some, then they'd probably pursue that. But I'm sure that's that would be my thinking. We would just take it from all of that, especially if you have any like PTO or anything like that, that they have to pay you, cash you out when you leave. Like, oh, yeah, we just take it from all that, too. Although the company has made this provision in the policy, which supposedly requires employees to repay costs incurred by the company, I wonder whether this is actually legally bonding or just an attempt to recover what the company bosses consider a lost investment. I was reading an article from Hopkins and Crawley Law Firm, which seems to suggest that there are at least some situations where an employer cannot require an employee to reimburse the company for training. I plan to continue researching this matter. Also, I listened to the previous program. It could have been workplace racism or the comp uh, compensatory call-in about employee opportunities in places with declining white populations. Yep, I'm thinking about relocating from where I currently reside, and I was thinking there are or will be some potential employment opportunities in other parts of the country, but after having listened to the book club study on James Lowen's book, Sundown Towns, and reading Blind Eye and Columbine, I have to seriously contemplate about moving to one of these racially restricted regions for work. I know there is no safe place in a universe under the system of racism white supremacy, but I think there would be a lot of overt racism. I would face living in a town or county that was 90% white. Ye. Yes, that would be something to, would be good to read James Lowen's book before making that decision. Blind Eye 2 since yes, he was growing up in Quincy and all. I think that could be demoralizing and potentially hazardous to my health. Thank you for offering the opportunity to share thoughts about racism in the workplace. Much obliged. I encourage everyone to research that because I'm sure there would be some variance by jurisdiction in terms of is it legally binding? Can your company require you to repay them for training opportunities that you know they may have even required you to partake in while having that job? Do some research. See if there's any anything written are there any reports uh, have there been any court cases in your state region you know addressing this sort of thing but check that out this is another reason read the policy and procedure don't just sign the form that oh yeah I read mm -hmm, read it all yep I understand uh, no read the whole thing like I said if it's you know 20 pages 30 pages you can read take Monday read 10 pages Tuesday Read 10 pages. Wednesday, read 10 pages. All done. Highlight. And if anything doesn't make sense, e question, how is this enforced? Is this just subtracted from, you know, your paycheck before you leave? Like, they should be able to tell you that. Like, wow, okay. I would definitely, that's the sort of thing you do not want to find this out. Once it's time for you, you want to know all of this in advance even how much does the training cost let me know that too before i go to the training like, oh, okay find out yeah because if i find out the training costs two hundred dollars white people like to go we got to bill you five thousand dollars for the training like whoa 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 the training was two hundred dollars like even matter of fact get that documented before the training how much does this training cost okay let me have a receipt for my records please thank you just in case amazing Read policy and procedure in full, in 
full reading we got it again reading is more important than watching television any folks uh, that we missed any other commentary they wanted to offer before we wrap up can you hear me yes ma'am oh um um hello um well i have been, i had talked before about how i um i um brought up racism at work and um well i actually sent an email around to the entire group and um about so that was about a month over a month ago and um so recently um I met with my one of the managers of human resources and um to they just gave me an update how they had talked to the people, you know, who were involved and all that other stuff, blah, blah, blah. But they were concerned well eventually it was probably they was concerned the way I talked to the um the racist suspects. Um well I and then I was asked if I had called them a racist and if I had I forgot I forgot what else because I was just now thinking I'm more upset now that it afterwards than I was during the meeting. I was I was I mean, I was nervous during the meeting, but, um, and so I, I said, I was honest. I said, I don't recall saying that, um, cause I really did not. I was so upset. I don't know what I, I, I really can't remember word for word what I said, but just thinking now after the meeting, thinking about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was definitely not smart. I mean, I sent the email. And then, but I, I, I had words with them afterwards, the people who I was sending an email about. And it, was, it did not go well. So, um, so as expected, I mean, I had been told this and I knew this would, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't really expect anything other than that, that, and then the human resources guy was saying, well, um, we don't want that to be the focus of this conversation because um, of how you reacted and, you know, like trying to cover it up, kind of, to clean up what the manager was saying. Um, cause when, and I told her, I said, well, I'm not sure I called the one woman racist, but I said, I, honestly, I said, I, I don't remember saying that to the other woman, but I said she is a racist, and she looked appalled that I said that. And, um, but I, I acknowledge that that probably, that was not the smartest thing to do to send an email in the future. I would go through, um, management or human resources when any concerns I had. And she looked pleased with that. And, um, so hopefully I'll just keep my job and be able to earn a living. Um, yeah, so. I mean, I don't know. I guess if if I could go back, would I do that again? I remember you asked me that before, and I said I would. You know, I wouldn't change anything, but yeah, I would not do that. Um, <laughs> you know I mean, I didn't. I didn't expect things to end well for me to turn out well, really. I mean, I, I, this is. I was, but I just. I don't know. I guess honestly, I probably didn't take it serious enough that. Just, uh, I probably did not. Um, <coughs> I kind of thought that I think I thought once I brought up the racism that I wouldn't be targeted as much as it was public. And because um, well, with the email, she said I I kind of involved people who weren't even involved with the you know with the email. Um, so, and this is the first time that anybody had mentioned that it was wrong, that the e- seat in the email was wrong. They hadn't, and this has been over a month, but they were still giving me, you know, letting me know they were working on things and blah, blah, blah. But the, like, 
was the last meeting. That was the first time that after a month they had to the, you know, let me know that that was not desirable to them. Which I knew that anyways, but, um, so yeah, that was not a wise decision, but there's nothing I could go, I can't go back in time and, <laughs> and change things, so. Yep, that's all I have to say. Thanks for letting me share. Much obliged for the update. I always say that I appreciate when people uh, let us kind of know how things have evolved in the workplace. If we give out, you know, suggestions that are incorrect uh, or, you know, if it does work, that's great, too. Um, I know that's, you know, something that I've talked about for a long time. I've heard Mr. Fuller as well. Uh, that I strongly agree with uh, in the workplace and beyond never calling a white person a racist unless they admit yes I am a racist and I you know bang got this in writing or I got the YouTube video of them saying it or I got the audio whatever unless they admit to saying that they are a racist never uh, in the workplace I've never seen where that works out to the benefit of a non-white person generally exactly what she said that will end up being you know the violation if you will that oh my god you have you know accused Rebecca of being a racist and that is unacceptable we we just can't have that (laughs) doesn't matter what they did how many times they called you a nigra how many racist jokes they told or whatever uh, they wore their favorite buckwheat sweatshirt to work all of that is irrelevant uh, you can never as a non-white person victim of racism we can never ever 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 prove that a white person is a racist so and they will always Voltron meaning white people will unite together to make sure oh no you do not sit here and accuse one of our sisters brothers of being a racist we just we got their back who do you think you are? That's what I've seen happen ten times out of nine. That's the way I meant to say it. That's what I've seen. Um, and in fact, I wouldn't even accuse them of being a suspected racist. Generally, what I recommend is pointing out the specific violation. Was policy and procedure violated? Like with the dog, was a law violated? Well, we can just be very specific with whatever the conduct was that was a problem as opposed to such, you know, he, she is a racist, uh, but and I appreciate her being honest. Honesty is such a, a important component because I say this all the time. We can do this all the time, as opposed to you coon and what's wrong with you. And I work with all these coons and all the rest of it. Man, get that mirror out. Where are things where we can get better? And I think for all of us, making sure that we always take white supremacy racism serious. It is not a joke, and words are so critically important. I hope that that is seriously conveyed uh, on this program, neutralizing workplace racism, and really all the time. That's why I even asked. I said that before today about all of the laughter in the segment on a raise, because I think getting extra money is serious. Money is so serious on the plantation. That's not, I mean, she talked about, uh, man. The CEO and manager had said I could get a raise, and they both left. And then I didn't have documentation, so now I don't get my raise. Man, that is not funny at all. Super, see, everything with racism is super serious, and white people, they always take, take it super serious as well. So that's a, a important, critical, really, uh, reminder for all of us in the importance of words uh, in the workplace. Uh, very important uh, especially that chart I generally would even I wouldn't even say suspected racist uh, it would have to be something really flagrant like someone called you a nigger or said you know I hate all the black people that type of thing before for it to be like what else you know <laughs> I can't there's nothing else I can call this but flagrant racism other than that I would just go with policy violation and all the rest of it and then we can get to see if it's racism you know once we get you know, figure all the rest of it out. But yeah, much, much obliged for being honest uh, about, you know, I guess what happened, the importance of being uh, serious about all of that. And uh, yes, I guess 
having all of this, I guess would it would it be correct to say, having been through all of this, that it would have been more helpful to you to not accuse this white woman of being a racist? Um. Yeah, if, if, I mean, yeah, it would have been that would have been better. Best. Is it something specifically like a violation or a different words you could have used to point out what the problem was with her conduct? Well, I had in the email I had listed exactly what was said, um, and I would just ask if they could not talk about those things while they were working in the office. And in the email, I didn't accuse anybody of being racist. Um, but um, not an email, but to their face when I talked to them, I did. Um, I, I mentioned that the comment was racist. But at the meeting, I couldn't remember what, because if I was being accused of saying someone was racist, I honestly couldn't remember at when I was being asked that. But I, to my recollection, and I have listened to this show before, and I remember you or someone else saying don't ever accuse a white person of being racist at work. And so I have a hard time believing that I said that. But I I told them in the email after the meeting, I said, I believe what I said was her comment was racist. But even that probably was too much, you know. So I was trying in the meeting, I was trying not to talk too much because sometimes saying too much, you can, you know, get even in more trouble from being misinterpreted or I don't know. So I was trying not to say too much, but um, because I haven't even been um, inquiring about any update to them. They would be telling me stuff and I would just say, okay, you know. Um, Yeah. Hmm. I see. That's important uh, because white people are master deceivers. They will lie. Uh, that's one, in, just in terms of you saying, like, taking it serious, where I, if, I mean, I would hope that for all of us, being so serious about all of this, and, you know, I don't call a white person a racist in the workplace or elsewhere, uh, that's why I always, when you hear me, it's admitted racist, and I have the audio proof to back that. But I would never say that. So the response is, well, I never call a white person a racist. What I said was the comment was racist. Now, that's totally different. Now, hey, now, like I said, that goes back to if it's spear chucker and all the rest of it, is that a racist thing to say? We get back in the question lane, see. Um, but even that, see, that they lie. See, they love it. They They know what was said was racist, but they will switch lie and make it that, oh, man, you called Heather a racist. Oh, my goodness. And we got to have 15 minutes. That, that's not even what I said. That's what still learning, all of us. I know I did not call Heather a racist. And we just go back to exact. That's being so precise about words. Oh, so critical. Documentation, emails, all of that. Even with that, that can just be, you know, Heather was being unprofessional. And we can just address the comments and making sure that everyone's being professional in the workplace. That also, I bring, I use that P word all the time. And often there will be commentary in the manual policy and procedure about being professional with what we say in the workplace. So that one normally you, you'll have a little bit more support uh, in terms of making sure that we at least give pretense that, oh, yes, we're supposed to, you know, conduct ourselves and watch what we say and how we behave. And yes, this is a business, not a brothel. Yes. Even the brothels have a code of ethics on the job. But, and also they asked me, because she had called, well, she had used the word bitch when she came back from the meeting Mm -hmm. after the incident first occurred. And they asked me about that because I had reported that. And they said, have you heard her use that before? And I said, yeah, she uses that all the time. Psycho bitch, uh, all this other stuff. Um, I guess they were asking me that because, they were, uh, I think they were trying to apply that she probably wasn't saying that to me. 
What is that? I believe that could be what trying to apply, maybe. That that's just the word she says. That's one of those. I didn't I'm, ask for clarification because I didn't want to. I didn't want to stay too long in that meeting with them. I'm sorry. What did you say? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard somebody talking. Mm-mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, but that it so that I, I but I so that's why I was. They were asking me that. Have I heard her use that word before? And that's what I was assuming that they meant while they were asking me that. It's because I think they were trying to imply that, well, she didn't, she wasn't, that was just another time. You know, she probably just told me she just said that because of something else, not directed at me. Mm. And that's just a word she probably said she just is a bad habit of using. It's just. I see. Um, so, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just was going to say uh, three things quickly. Uh, the just being precise again in the workplace, if it's to the point where you're, you know, are making a report about it, that this is serious. You felt this was incorrect. Uh, it was a problem for you having to hear this in the workplace. Take it so serious. This is exactly what I said. This is the exact report that I made. These are the exact words that I used. And even that with what she said, no, this is the exact sentence wording context of what took place she like all of that that's you know why we talk about the importance of being uh serious and even with that too it would be why i talk about hey is there something in policy and procedure about professionalism like is that professional is that how we should conduct ourselves anyway even beyond this if someone in the workplace be walking around and using profanity like that on a regular basis have a uh, reputation that's just a part of their personality should that be allowed that would even be something I'd be thinking about too and just being professional and then uh, the not over talking I think is important too That's I'm such a big advocate of asking questions so that you can just be bullet right to this is what was said or this is the exact uh, problem this is the conduct uh, that we are evaluating to see if this you know is in violation of policy and procedure and what should be done about this big advocate of not over talking so we can just then we don't get sidetracked into what did you call her a racist and all this other nonsense and you know razor sharp that way you don't have to spend a whole hour in the meeting uh we we did our whole three hours plus some um, i did think that was important but just importance of being serious because they will lie even if you didn't call a white person a racist if you just mention the term racism bang they will lie and you called it and change everything all around master deceivers in the workplace ah so important words words critically important um we'll be here tomorrow for the compensatory call in same time 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific uh, dial in. We'll catch up on what happened over the past week or so. Uh, Kansas again had a black uh, child, black female student who was assaulted by a white male student. They had a rally. Looked like I think they said it was like hundreds of students. Might have been a thousand were out in the street, and the white student got charged with felony assault. Uh, I don't think he got a hate crime, but we'll chat about that and other yeah. events that have taken place this past uh, seven days or so. Much obliged for everyone tuning in. Hopefully worthy of your Friday evening sobriety would be best doubly so if you got to go to any of these holiday parties creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately cow signing out thanks all for tuning in nigga you so brainwashed i'm a victim no brother problem. I'm a victim uh, i'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning shut up the man has programmed my conditioning mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.